Okay, good morning, everyone. I managed to put my reading glasses box into my purse, but there's no reading glasses in there. So this should be a fun meeting. Good to see everybody here, and um, now I know why I had to park in the back 40. Okay, let's see if I can read this. <laughs> Calling to order the Tourist and Development Council meeting on uh, May 11th, 2023 at 9 a.m. Bless you. Thank you. It's really awful getting old, guys. It really <laughs> is. Anyway, so, invocation. Would you like to do the normal? Yes. Okay. Y'all join me, please bow your heads, Heavenly Father. We thank you again for this opportunity to meet. We thank you for letting good things happen here today. We thank you for a spirit of unity. We just thank you, Lord, for everything you give us. We always lift up our first responders to you. And as always, let us be a blessing. In Jesus' name, we ask these things and thank you. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Jackie. You're all right. right. Roll call, please. Oh. So, uh, present we have Chair Holly Davis, Vice Chair Mike Ingalls, Dr. Bresh Desai, uh, Council Member Jackie Hepfer, Council Member Cindy Guy, and Michael Mankey. Absent is Mike Shoemaker, who's in Daytona for a state conference, and Ashton Schrock. So we have a quorum. Awesome. All right. And looking for a motion of approval of agenda, please. Move approval. There Second. is one change. Um, okay. The, uh, the, uh, our Tempest person had a work conflict. He got sent to Little Rock. So he's on a plane currently. So he'll make that presentation in June. Okay. Theoretically. He, he said he'd already marked his calendar, so uh, it's information only, but uh, it's good information. So but that's, okay. that's the only Modify change. It. Move approval with the change. Second. All right. First by Councilwoman Hepner. Second by Councilwoman Guy. Um, any board discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Okay. Appro looking for approval of minutes? So, so moved. moved. Second. <laughs> Motion by Ms. Guy, second by Ms. Hubner. Any board discussion? Yes. Yes. Uh, the last part, my idea in the workshop, that was a separate thought, not just because of Florida. I don't know if it requires a re revision, but the workshop or planning session was more big picture, not just the visit Florida attractions. Okay. So it, it's in one sentence here. I don't know that it's worth a revision, but I did want to clarify that. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. All right. Um, open to the public. Three minutes. State your name, where you live. I'm Michael Shulman. I live in Inverness. I go by Max. Um, this month I'd, I would like to uh, talk fast about uh, the issue of the uh, Camp Visitor boat ramp closing. First to say that it's a big mistake to lose a small boat ramp. We always have a lot of conflicts between kayaks and canoes and those folks with our very busy boat ramp. So losing one that was primarily a kayaker's launch is not a good thing. We should be doing more. More important to me though, is that uh, that's one of the few ramps. We name our ramps by the streets. That's not good tourism. Ecotourism is built on, on both the topography and geography, but also on the cultural and historic nature of the community. And uh, we have some good history and we don't do a good job. We need to use our historical society more, but particularly I'd like to, to stand for James Izzard, for whom it's named. Uh, Lieutenant James Izzard was born in 1811. He was a member of the West Point class of 19, or 1828. He fought in the Black Hawk Wars and he had no reason to be here, uh, to be on the borders of our county. Um, he had completed his service to West Point, the service commitment, and during his time at West Point and then his service that followed, his father, who was one of the heroes of the uh, Battle of New Orleans, died while being the first governor of Arkansas and he wanted to get home. 
but it was personally contacted by General Gaines because we'd had our butt, the folks on this side of the river had had their butts kicked by the Seminoles three times. The lieutenant was a known dragoon leader. Dragoons were a predecessor of, of cavalry. They're horse-born combatants, and he was a leader. And uh, he was testing the forge to go across the river to engage the Seminoles. And I get a little emotion about it, because halfway across the river, right, when he would be coming into Citrus County, he was shot through the eye. He had the fourth, fourth width and the character to turn his horse around, tell his men, go to ground and stay to ground, send a rider to Gaines and let him know this is not a place to cross, and there is at least a 1,000 Seminoles in there, and they know how to shoot. He died five days later, and they named the, the camp for him where he died, which is what the boat ramp's named for. The spot marked the place where for many years after the 50th anniversary of his death, members of the community on that side of the river and Dinellon would cross over into what's, what is now Marion County when we're not, to the uh, preserve over there to celebrate his heroism. We need to name the spruce boat ramp after Lieutenant James F. Izzard, and we need to remember our history. Thank you. Thanks. Anyone else? Good morning. My name is John Labriola, and um, I'm here to uh, uh, discuss the DEI program that I was happy to hear um, has been uh, dropped by the county commission, and they're not going to be pursuing that. This was a program that the TDC unanimously approved back in January. Um, I watched the video, I wasn't here, but I watched the video. It was a 10 minute long presentation about this DEI program, and uh, which included you know, marketing specifically to LGBT and other groups. Um, and uh, so I was happy to see that the county commission decided to drop it, but I was cr quite disturbed to see that this city, I mean, this uh, city board um, had absolutely no qualms about it, just went ahead and voted for it unanimously um, with absolutely no discussion as to, you know, its negative implications or perhaps even being self-aware enough to understand that that would not, that would not um, go over well, let's say, in this community. So um, I know that... Uh, Commissioner Davis has said she regrets it. So I would like to hear that from the rest of you, especially the two elected officials. Do you regret this? Please address this and let us know that you also feel that this is not appropriate for our community. Thank you. Anyone else? Good morning, everyone. My name is Michael Connell. I'm from Floral City and uh, I hate to keep beating a dead horse, but I'm afraid this dead horse is not dead yet. And that is this money spent without Coast Magazine, which is really part of the DEI whole program that supposedly died. Um, I'm sorry, I, we emailed and I haven't been able to get back to, to respond to you yet. But I figured this would be a good time to talk about it. So, um, my opinion, and I think the opinion of a lot of people in this county, is that advertising to bring people in is a great thing, obviously. What's not good is when you advertise to people specifically based on their sexual behavior and proclivities. Okay, that is, in a normally sane world, you would not be able to advertise in that way. And this is a pretty <coughs> sane county, I think. So this needs to really die, as it was claimed to have died. But this $2,250, I think, every year or for six or seven months of advertising um, needs to end. And I realize it, it gets um, brought up on March 3rd, I believe. So um, I'd like to know as soon as possible that, that uh, sanity has come back to this board and you're going to end this um, but if it has to go on until March we'll we'll revisit it but I would like to have that addressed as well okay advertising to a group based on their sexual behavior is unacceptable okay that's 
all I have to say. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Mr. Shulman, where did you go? There you are, you're hiding. Um, I'm not aware of what was the other spruce boat ramp? The and you can't, you know, you can't answer from the audience, but um, the BOCC heard this and we already gave Izzard away. The or closed it, you know, gave it to the private owner. Um, it is incredibly rare that the BOCC gives up access to water. Incredibly rare. And so I know for a fact that I looked into it very deeply and I assume my colleagues did as well. Essentially, FWC is the one who swayed us because they got up there and they said that they would love to find a different spot close by to do a different water access. So if you have not read or watched the video from that meeting, I would go back and look at that. And, um, and but, but we can talk about it later, but I, I love your passion. And I love that you know the history of the county and that you're you're working so avidly from, you know, as a volunteer to do great positive things in the county. So thank you for that. Um, Mr. Labriola, I regretted the vote for DEI as those three letters because they have been weaponized by the far left to have the far right bend the knee. I don't like anyone who tries to weaponize things to get other people to bend to their will. That includes the far left. That includes the far right. Mr. O'Connell, the reason I sent you that email is that you would be surprised if you think of me as someone that doesn't actually have horns sprouting out of her head, you'd be surprised that there's probably quite a few things that you and I agree on. And so that's why I wanted to hear from you that you would be okay with some things us not agreeing on, but I'm happy to have a very frank discussion with you about those things, okay? But it has to be collegial. If it's going nowhere, I don't, I'm not gonna waste my time, quite frankly. So, um, as far as your comments about it being sexual behavior, it's not about sexual behavior, it's about who you fall in love with. And someone said that they don't want to see gay people making out on boats and whatnot and bringing us down. I'm like, I don't wanna see anyone making out. That's just bad behavior. <laughs> You know, check the PDA, you know, that goes if you're straight, gay, whatever, you know, and some of the worst behaving tourists in this county have been straight white males who get out of their boat on people's lawns and blue waters to poop on the lawns. Okay, so, you know, we advertise to a lot of different segments. I don't, you know, soccer moms, you know, probably not for tourism, but, you know, we marketing people segment all kinds of different markets and it is. You know, if you really wanted to look at it from a segmentation standpoint, you know, LGBTQ is five to 10 per, I cannot believe I can say those letters so rapidly. Really? This job has beat it into me. Um, five to 10% of um, the population identifies as that, which means a whole lot of friends and family are fine with it, you know? And so by that means we ought to be spending five to 10% of our budget on that. We don't, it's just, it's like a drop that we're spending on that. So anyway, I would love to hear from the board. Y'all chime in because I keep getting hung out to drive. <laughs> Come on, I need some wing men and wing women, please. You said it well. I mean, love the sinner, hate the sin. There you go. That's all it is. It's none of my business. I'm a big MYOB kind of person. What you Get do behind room. closed doors is fine. Get a room covers everyone. Yeah, Get a room covers everyone. <laughs> Um, well, and uh, I think it was Mr. Labriola, I'll point blank say I do not regret and will not rescind my vote uh, for approving it back in January. I think uh, marketing to any part of the population mm -hmm. is totally appropriate, whether we agree on a personal level or not. Um, so I have uh, no regret over my vote. I just regret the letter part. You know, just treat yeah. people like people. And Mr. O'Connell, your wife said it exactly. Just treat people like people. That's what we're doing. So. Well, and I think it was to include people with, you know, uh, special needs as well. Yeah, people in wheelchairs. And, and blended and families. And yeah. They're just right. hanging yeah. up on one issue. Yeah, so, you know, it was a lot wider than sexual orientation to begin with. Um, but some folks have focused on one very narrow aspect of it. 
Anyone yeah, else? Well, yeah, well, I mean, we're, we're saying there, it was included different ethnic groups, too. Yes. So it just wasn't. You're not allowed to speak from the audience. I'm sorry, Mr. O'Connell. Yeah. Those are the words. Those, no, it's not no. ridiculous. This, this is our board. These are our opinions, and you're not respecting our opinions nor the rules of this chamber. So, yes, I am respecting your opinion, and that's why I've continued to engage with you, even though anyone will tell an elected official, don't bother. But I do. So, any other board discussion? Anyone? All right. Carrying on. <clears throat> All right. So, Tempest is back burnered. Correct. So, uh, Chris Kingery, as you remember, is our uh, professional bass fisherman that uh, we've sponsored uh, for the last few years. Uh, and he's been out on the circuit again. Uh, and he's here to give you an update on as we're moving forward on where he's been and how it's been going. So, I'll turn it over to Chris. Saw you at the stoplight. <laughs> I admired the big logo. I, I did see you there. Yeah. Um, you can uh -oh. drive with the, <laughs> now, you can drive with that gold. Button. Okay. Just the, the white button there. Yeah. Okay. All right. So uh, I want to thank everybody again for, uh, you know, having me on for another year. Uh, I'm sorry I'm a little late for my update. Usually it's in the fall and uh, the travel schedule this last year has been a little crazy. So I haven't really lined up with uh, the meeting dates to be able to be here to uh, to give you an update. So you're typical than a, rather than a 2022 update, I guess this is a, a preview or mid 2023 update as well. So far, um, last year was a, a great year for tourism and for, uh, getting our branding out, um, to different States. I traveled from, you know, a tournament here, uh, at Lake Toho and Kissimmee, uh, all the way to New York last year and as far out as Texas at Sam Rayburn. Um, and it's amazing to me still that how recognized our area is, even as far as Texas or, you know, and I was in Mississippi and what really struck home uh, as far as the branding of the word Crystal River, it is associated with Citrus County uh, heavily, uh, re regardless of whether, you know, the the advertising of our freshwater lakes is in Inverness or wherever, it brings everybody into our county because they do recognize that name as well as Ocala and the villages and Tampa as a whole. And usually when you have to describe to somebody where Citrus County is, you usually use some of those indicators. Uh, Crystal River is becoming uh, a very, very well-known name to, to call it 10 miles, 20 miles within that range to get to our lakes and to get to our, our saltwater fishing as well. Uh, I was, you know, the, I've always known how effective the branding of a wrap is on a, on a boat or a truck. Uh, and, and the big thing is that you do have a person that can receive feedback from that billboard as opposed to just driving down the highway and seeing it all over the place. Now, uh, this year it was really made apparent to me on how far those impressions reach. Every dock that I fish behind at every event the logo is seen prominently on the boat and and that's that's a given but when it was really uh told to me that it was you know really working is i had a lady come out of her back from her back porch come running out to her dock just to say hi to me and said are you really from crystal river and i said well citrus county yes as a whole and she said i used to live there and my my sister still lives there and I, i'm gonna go visit her next month um and, you know, just stuff like that. You don't realize how many people are watching on a regular basis until something like that happens. And so uh, before, you know, last year, I had always taken it as gas stations, hotels, boat ramps, you know, and I can't go anywhere without meeting somebody or talking to somebody about that. And that's usually the conversation starter is where is Crystal River uh, and where is Citrus County? Where's Inverness? Because I have Inverness, Home Sassa, Floral City as well on there. And all of those things, you know, Homosassa gets recognized quite a bit as well. Um, and that's for scallop season, manatees, everything that we offer as a whole. And they, the, the first thing they do ask me is, oh, you're a fisherman. How, how is the fishing in the area? And, you know, my first thing to say is uh, we have some of the most beautiful lakes you'll ever find that are untouched and, and not commercialized. And that's a big part of people that are looking to relax and find things to do is to, to find a little bit of untouched Florida where everything else in the bigger areas is being commercialized with heavy 
house building and docks and uh, you know, even in some of the other counties where they're actually trying to get tournaments taken away from their lakes due to homeowners uh, requesting that it's just a pleasure boat lake. And in some of the other places I've been, uh, you know, like Norman and uh, some places like that, they're actually closing down Airbnbs in those areas because they're turning into party lakes from recreational traffic. So I, I, I commend our county on preserving some of our natural resources in our uh, our local lakes on the Salapopka chain and Lake Russo and things like that. And I, I think that we have some world-class fisheries that, that have not been exposed yet. You know, Lake Hernando gets multiple fish over 10 pounds a year that are weighed in. Uh, you know, almost every month at my store at 44 Tackle, we get, uh, we get reports of 10, 12, 13 pound fish being caught out of Lake Hernando. You know, that's, that's something to brag about. Lake Russo, same thing, 10, 12, 13 pound fish. Um, Lake Henderson this year, we've had three fish over 10 pounds caught. You know, it's been, it's been a growing area for stuff like that. And that's what gets people excited about coming here is knowing that at any chance in Florida, the dream that they're sold coming to Florida to fish is that they're going to catch a 10 pounder at any time. And, that, and that's highly possible here in any of our lakes. Um, I, I think that we've done a great job for, for promoting that. So this year, uh, or last year, I fished nine tournaments out of state, um, and we, we had a lot of really good impacts. Uh, the standings were not as great last year as, as before. Um, I'm not sure, you know, some people call it a slump year. I ended up uh, basically out of the 83 people last year that were doing all nine events, I was uh, 47th in points. Um, this, this year, uh, we've already had three events, and I've had some big impacts, and I can show some of our media coverage and things like that. So with the Bassmaster Opens, it's a qualifying league for the Bassmaster Elite Series, which is what you'll see on TV a lot of times, uh, you know, live on Fox on Saturday. Uh, and they're getting unprecedented numbers on their, their impressions online. And so uh, they've got an event getting ready to start here tomorrow on Lay Lake, Alabama. Um, I actually will be traveling to Wheeler Lake uh, in Alabama Friday, so I, I was able to just catch it because I just got back from Virginia on Saturday. So it's been it's been quite a travel schedule. Um, but the qualifying league of that is this year they have changed the the way that works to where we now have to fish all nine events to make the elite series, whereas previously you could do it in just three. Now they're offering nine play, the top nine people a place on the OT series. So it's changed the way that the, the format works. And this year they have 172 people in that. So out of the 172, after three events, I'm sitting in 61st. Um, there's plenty of room with, you know, five events left uh, to make some moves to get up to that top 10. So I'm pretty excited about the way things are going this year. Um, so just a little history of me for anybody that doesn't know me um, uh, on the board or or in the audience. Um, you know, I'm 34 years old. I'm born and raised here in Citrus County. Uh, I own 44 Tackle in Inverness. I like to call us almost the welcome center for fishermen in, in our side of the county um, because, uh, you know, between me and the guys I have working for me, they're all fishermen. Everybody is actually born and raised here, believe it or not. Uh, even uh, my oldest manager um, in his 50s, he was born and raised in Crystal River. So, uh, you know, we have, we have deep roots here between all of our employees and they, they have made it to where, uh, you know, all of the people that come into town really feel at home. We've never been one to sell people on product. We're selling people on fishing and I've had people come in with their wallet open, go and say, you know, just outfit me with the best of the best. I don't care how much I spend today. And we'll still send them out with $15 in baits and say, come back and tell us how you did before we get you to the next level. <clears throat> We want them to come back and catch fish and really enjoy their experience here. So that's something we pride with our employees as well. And, you know, we get asked on a regular basis, not just about what happens, you know, on the lakes, but we get asked when somebody comes to town, what's the area like? Where do we stay? Where do we eat? Where do we eat is the biggest one. Where's the best place to eat? You know, we've got some great restaurants in Inverness. Um, as well as, you know, Crystal River, we, we usually send people to the, some of the hot spots and, and some of the local favorites that, you know, I've grown up knowing. And I think that's, that's a big part. And um, so I've had the, the, uh, a small hiccup as of uh, 2022 was 
Uh, I had someone hack my Facebook and Instagram account. Um, and so I've had to restart my Facebook and Instagram following. So I've lost 4,000 followers over that. And Facebook and Instagram with their layoffs have had, you know, a lot of time to try to resolve this and they will not resolve to what I need. So I've had to start over. So in, in three months time, you know, I've, I've kind of built up some followers here and there, but the reach is, has been pretty consistent with what I had before. So I don't even know that our followers were, were getting as much engagement as they should have been back when I did have 4,000 followers. So I've, uh, I've actually extended into TikTok quite a bit um, as, a, as a platform, and it's actually become more of an engaging platform uh, through direct messages and personal messages than anything, really asking hard questions about that you wouldn't just get out in a video. So it, it becomes a relationship with the follower rather than just somebody that's flipping through their feed and hitting the like button. And I, I think that those engagements are more valuable and it's been, it's, it's had a lot of traction. And I know due to certain things, I know that there's an advantage to me uh, running TikTok for a, a social platform uh, due to limitations of the tourism, uh, not being able to use it as a marketing tool. So as a secondary option, it gives you guys the exposure that you're looking for um, through a channel that you can't access at the moment. Um, and so I was at, in 2022, 2023, uh, I was on multiple TV shows. Um, two episodes were actually through Sweetwater TV, which were not contracted by the county. I have a friend that I've known for years, Miles Berghoff. Um, you guys may be familiar with the name Berghoff. His dad is actually uh, Gary Berghoff, who is on the hit show MASH. Uh, Miles has been a very good friend of mine for the last eight years. We've traveled together on the opens and he had Sweetwater TV. Uh, the episodes I was on were actually the last, very last two episodes of the whole series now that it's been discontinued. So forever that will be in that series and it was organically done that they put a whole show of basically a half a show about why Miles came to town, how we've been friends for years and uh, kind of hit home on why he was coming to Citrus County at all. And that was completely free to the county. That was just based on my relationship with him that it kind of fell into place. So we did one episode on Lake Penasofki and one, lakes on, uh, one episode on Lake Henderson. Um, the uh, episode with Real Animals went well with Mike Anderson as well. That aired in 2022. And, uh, and then recently with uh, Sportsman's Adventures with uh, Captain Rick Murphy. And in that, I helped with him on, on kind of the storyline of, of that episode to really focus on some of the better parts of Lake Henderson that you could go to the cove by water. And they did a huge little, uh, I guess a, a really big thing was that they did an expose on, on the cove in downtown Inverness. I took them around and showed them everything uh, about our town that would be something people would be interested in. And it also piggybacked, uh, I think it was go RVing or go out RVing. Uh, I think, or RV, RV oh, yeah, there, that's yeah. RV there yeah. Best brand so, name ever. Yeah, so, <laughs> so it actually piggybacked side by side with that when those episodes aired, that it, the marketing double hit for the Cove and for Inverness as a whole. Mm -hmm. And so that, that really worked out well timing wise. And everybody that I've filmed with uh, that, that I've had the, the pleasure of John setting me up with has been very good. And we, we focus on all of the aspects. On the Captain Rick Murphy show, we actually caught every species that lives in the lake in that one episode. So whether or not we caught big fish in that episode, it was the showcase of the amount of species of fish that you could catch in freshwater that some people probably didn't even know that lived there. So that was, that was a really good deal for, for that episode. Um, so these are just some pictures that were published on Bassmaster.com and also, uh, 2022, I won the big bag for the Inverness, uh, big bass classic. Um, see one of those people in the audience here. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, we, you know, Lake Henderson's been a great fishery. We have the Wednesday nighters that we, we are involved with, uh, that have been here for 25 to 30 years now running. And it, it, it's not a very promoted thing. It's kind of a grassroots deal. But, you know, this year we have had 30 to 40 boats almost uh, every tournament. So that, that means two people per boat. That's, that's 60 people. And they're traveling from out of county as well just to come to our lake to fish that Wednesday night or to break up their week. So we've, we've had people as far as Tampa and 
uh, cross city come on a regular basis to fish those tournaments. So that's, that's a pretty exciting number for us to be running a tournament weekly like that. Um, so on my, my big break this year would be on Toledo Bend uh, on the Texas-Louisiana border. Uh, I had a video that kind of went a little bit viral on TikTok this year uh, that hit 70, I think it's at 75, almost 80,000 views uh, for a nine pounder I caught on a 360 camera that I'm now running on my, on my boat at all, every day of every tournament. And uh, it was uh, it was kind of a, a little bit of a crap show, if you will, uh, running around the boat. But, um, you know, a nine pounder during a tournament is a big deal. Um, and so that, that was a big showcase that I got a blog post made about that, as well as uh, some headlines that, that were made for that. And, uh, you know, I've, I've been very active with the, the Bassmaster staff this year due to the the new status of the Bassmaster Elite qualifying class that we're in, they're upping their coverage for us and almost treating us like the Elite Series because they're grooming us to be in the Elite Series before we get there. And so now they've given us um, on their website, they've given us full profile pages that showcase our truck, our boat, and our um, our you know jersey and and stats and things like like that. So uh, that, that's a new thing for us that, that we've been exposed to this year. And they're really giving us access to their staff on a media relations area that if we have anything go on during the tournament, we, we have full access to text them during the tournament to come over and take pictures of us and, and things like that that weren't at our disposal before. So they've, they've really taken care of us on that. But one thing, uh, you know, I've still got five more tournaments this year, uh, and this is these are the longer trips. I'm going to Oklahoma uh, in June, then to New York in uh, July, as well as uh, then we've got a six, uh, four week kind of on the road trip between Watts Bar, Tennessee, and Lake of the Ozarks. So this is probably the, the longest stretch of travel I've got this year, but it's uh, it's fast and furious, and uh, you know I wouldn't do it any other way, but. Once again, I can't thank you guys enough for your support. And if you guys have any questions for me, please let me know. Um, and outside of this meeting, obviously, everybody's, I talk to Mike on a regular basis. Um, he's, I think he's probably one of my biggest fans on social. <laughs> um, but no, we, uh, I really do enjoy uh, what, you know, what I'm able to do for the county. Thank you. Or do you have any questions for him? Yeah, he's awesome. Did a nine pounder get big bass of a tournament? No. <laughs> <laughs> but by like uh i think it was a a nine uh, mine was a uh mine was nine even and nine eight one big bass oh, and wow. actually there was four bass over nine pounds that that tournament on toledo bend wow. so it was a it was a pretty big deal but just, mm -hmm. do you put them back yes catch and yes it's all catch and release cool. yep thank you all right thank you Everybody bring their wallet. Krista River's next. <laughs> cha <-ching. laughs> So just a brief intro on that. The, a few months ago, we met with both the cities, uh, Commissioner Davis and I did, and asked them about a, a wish list. So this is the first step. This is probably uh, everything <laughs> they could think of, both cities, I would imagine. And then the next step would be to have the board decide what do you really want to see more information about and then we run it through the normal gambit of legal and all those sort of things. I, I didn't want to do that at this round because I, uh, I was afraid it would get stopped up and we wouldn't get to hear from them in, yet. If we tried to, if we took their list and ran it through legal, I figured they would point out some things that you can't do and it might get jammed up. So I asked them just to come and make a presentation and then we'll move forward uh, the board will move forward if they wish to hear for more information like I said then we'll get them to flesh out of an application and and they'll have all the information but this today for both both communities are just uh, here's what we're looking at so at this point uh, we did alphabetical there wasn't any favoritism <laughs> I just saying, I, what's that e 
Oh, I, I didn't drill. I didn't drill down to that rabbit hole. <laughs> I went with. I went with where you work. Should have done rock paper scissors, John. Yeah. Well, there's only two. I guess we could have done that. But I thought. I vote for arm wrestling. Yeah. Well, they're both going to get to. Either way, they're both going to get to go. So, uh, but at this point, I'll let Ken uh, walk you through Crystal Rivers' plan. Thank you, John, and good morning, board. Chair Davis. Um, Holly had said something at a previous meeting that really kind of got me excited and, and, and Councilwoman Guy excited too. We kind of transitioned from tourism marketing to a tourism management. And I never heard that statement before. Came from it, John. It was, it was a breath of fresh air because I would tell you previous leadership on, the, on this board numerous times would tell me that, hey, it's the TDC's job to get these people to Crystal River. It's the city's job to figure out what to do when they get there. And I, we just, we don't have the resources to deal with a million tourists a year that are coming to our little city of 3,000. Uh, what that equates to is for every one resident that I've got, their ad valorem taxes are supporting the needs of 300 tourists each. So it's, it's, it's daunting. So we, we know we're in this together and we appreciate the partnership and we just want to move forward with it. Uh, what I want to show, show you is, um, let's figure out how to do this. I just want to talk about kind of what, what is the TDC promoting? And then in, in, in our vision, I mean, what we're actually seeing in real time what are our guests experiencing when they do get to Crystal River? I want to talk about the plan that John mentioned, um, and then the big ask at the end. And there's not a dollar sign attached to that ask, so I just precursor that. So, How so first, what's that? How many commas? There's a lot of commas. More. <laughs> <laughs> so first, you know, what are we promoting? And in, in your splash screen earlier, there, there's a there's really nice pictures: three sisters with a serene manatee on the bottom and a single kayak. is gorgeous, right? And, that, and that's what we're promoting, right? And that's what we want people that are coming here to see. So these are just, I, I just stole these from y'all's website yesterday. I was putting these together. And, you know, people are expecting to see this when they come to Crystal River, right? Um, you know, beautiful manatees, crystal clear water. And you, you talk to a lot of these manatee guys when they get there. Sometimes the water's so murky they can't even see a manatee. So uh, what, what do they see? What, are, what do they expect to see? Two different things. Um, another shot from your website. This one was interesting. This is a 360 view of our Hunter Springs Beach, which we have huge issues with, and I'll talk about those in a second. But you can see there's plenty of places to swim. There's plenty of places to camp out on and let your kids play. So what are our guests actually experiencing? So these, these are just pictures that I've taken, friends have taken and whatnot, and this is, this, these are real. So this is leading to the Three Sisters Canal. This is any given weekend, that's what it looks like. And try and get a boat through there and trying not to have three or four of these kayaks colliding, hitting, landing on top of each other. This is trying to get up into Three Sisters on a given Saturday. Uh, there was one point, I think it was last year, where Joyce is doing a study. She counted, I think it's over 200 kayaks at one time in Three Sisters. Not all day, but at one time in Three Sisters. So it's, we got a lot of people coming. Again, this is out in front of Three Sisters. These are some aerials taken around Hunter Springs Cove, and I counted well over 100 boats and kayaks in that one little picture. This is our little beach, and this, this is really, it's a city issue for the most part to deal with, we, we, and I'll talk about that in a second. We've got some very unique challenges. It's kind of giving us some obstacles to get there eventually, but we need to work on getting our beach straightened out. This is just any given Saturday, just trying to find a parking space. These are mostly by Pete's Pier and then going back into Hunter Springs. we got a huge parking issue. There's, there's, there's no place for these people to park. Um, they're getting towed. Um, there's a little market industry popping up where we've got a lot of vacant lots letting people park there. So it's kind of working itself out, but it's, it is a big issue. Um, this, this is a shot of, I think everybody's aware of the success of the Save Crystal River story. So they came in here seven years ago and, and took matters into their own hands of the just grassroots, grassroots citizens, got the legislature to fund the cleaning up of eelgrass, on, or at the planting of new eelgrass in and around Kings Bay. Now they're doing it down in Homosassa, removing the lingvia, removing the detritus material, and putting back eelgrass. What's happening, and we see it in real time, is the manatees are chewing up the eelgrass. It eventually grows back, but they chew up the really soft, Good stuff at the bottom and then the crap at the top floats to the top and that's what it looks like um, imagine your manatee tour groups trying to see a manatee in that so uh, save crystal river is has come up with a way to address this but they're running into obstacles so we, we could use your help with that this is something i, I 
did not want to show you, but you need to see it. Our little bathrooms at Hunter Springs Park, or, or meant, it's, it's a local park, is meant for, you know, small picnics and whatnot. There's more people using our restrooms that we can't even get in there to clean them. They're, they're busy, busy so often, and people get upset and they leave messes like this, and your visitors are seeing that. And it's not because we don't want to clean it up. We just don't have the staff to get in there and do it. We've doubled our staff over the past year, two years, to try and address this, but this is all with city taxpayer money. So we just need some help financially to address these kind of things. So the visitors that we're bringing into Citrus County, Crystal River, have the experience that they're expecting to see. So here's my tourism mitigation plan, that's what I call it. This is, this is, this is a splatter shot. I know there's some things in here that this, this, this board could not touch, but I just want to let you know what we're facing. And, and the gravity and the dollar amount of things that the city of Crystal River has to deal with and where we are going to be asking for some help. So first is, is our Kings Bay Park kayak launch facility. We and, and Councilwoman Guy led the charge. We moved all of our commercial launches out of Hunter Springs Park to try and deal with the, the overcrowding down there to Kings Bay Park. And now we're launching 50,000 kayaks annually out of that park. Now we do charge five bucks a launch and we're bringing in about $250,000 a year net, but we've got a $3 million need to provide the adequate facilities. Because right now they're launching off of you know, residential type kayak launches. Uh, we did make a promise to the vendors we put out there that we would upgrade them using the proceeds from that program. And the $250,000 a year, it's gonna eventually get there, but we need, to, we need to amp that up and get it done sooner than later. We have started the design. We just hired a engineer uh, Monday night to start the design and permitting of, of a master plan that was put into place earlier that year. So that is under, un, ongoing. This is a really good project, I think, that for the TDC to partner with us on. Restroom expansion for Hunter Springs Park. Um, and one of the things when, when this, this board has to look at spending TDC money, does it benefit tourism? And I think just the ability for the tourists to go actually use a clean bathroom is probably benefits them, benefits all of us. So what was once a city park is now drawing from around the state. There's people coming in from all over. Our um, Waterfronts Advisory Board did a study a couple years ago, and 5 to 10 percent of the, of the people in the park actually came from Crystal River. Most of them are just coming from elsewhere. So we're severely overcrowded with a very limited ability to cap attendance. And then our bathrooms are woefully undersized. And when I talk about a wolf, the, the inability to cap attendance, the way to do that is to put somebody out at the gate with a clicker and say, hey, when you get to 500 people, the gates are closed. Problem is I got to pay for that. And I'm not going to do it with city residents' money because they can't even use this park because there's so many other people coming in to use it. So the idea is, hey, well, let's just start charging a nominal five bucks to get into the park. The issue is there's a century-old deed restriction when we purchased the property in 1936, I think it was, that says the swimming will remain free to the white race in Hunter Springs Park. And it's a deed restriction. Um, you, you can scratch out white race and it becomes legal. You can do that. Um, and the issue is if the an heir to that property or what would have been an heir to that property calls the city out on that, we have to give them the property back for the 136 bucks that we bought it for. So we're, we're going through this exhaustive air search. Right now we're coming to dead ends, which is good. Um, if we do find one, you know, we will probably have to buy, it, buy out that right from them, pay them for it. But once we have that in place, we can start charging, start charging a nominal fee, have somebody out there clicking, and then we will know when we get to capacity what time it is to shut it down. Plus give us a pretty decent revenue source to, number one, pay for that person and better bathrooms or whatnot. <clears throat> so that's ongoing. Uh, we also have to deal with our neighbors out there because they're seeing the, bra the they're, they're getting killed out there with, with people coming up and down through there. Uh, we're having to modify some roads. Uh, they're, they partner with us on moving their driveways around. So that, that's in process. So we're, we're moving that as well. Um, and we do not have money for restroom expansion. So that's another precursor. Hunter Springs Park dredging. The issue is, and, and, and I think, uh, Commissioner Davis probably will recognize these pictures, you know, through decades and decades of just renourishing that beach, uh, there's approximately two feet of sediment is, is endangering the spring. It's actually getting out into the spring. Uh, we estimate it's about $200,000 to get somebody to come in there and suction dredge that sand back. 
The picture on the left was taken in the 60s or 70s, and you can see the old pier that was out there and where the I sand line was. I jumped off that pier. What's that? I jumped off that pier. <laughs> you were probably yeah. there. I was probably there. <laughs> so the one on the left, was that's about 50 years old. And then on the right, you can see that sand is just slowly making its way out, and it's getting into the spring now. So it, it's just time, like any other beach around the state, it's time to, to uh, maintain that beach and pull that material out of there. Downtown parking. This is a huge one. Uh, the massive influx of tourists has created a huge parking issue in downtown Crystal River. We are going through steps to mitigate that, but we certainly can use some help on it. We budgeted $100,000 last year for design and then half a million this year for construction of a new, actually upgraded parking lot on Northwest First Avenue. What we need is uh, construction of additional parking lots and downtown on-street and off-street parking to give these people a place to park. Because right now they're just parking all over the place. We're writing a ton of tickets, I will tell you that. And we're not gonna slow down until we can find them a place that they can park legally. So we have started the permitting of the on-street parking, but we have not identified funding for construction. Do you mind if we ask questions as we go along? Go ahead. Can you back up one? I don't know. Yes. Um, can you tell us where you are with the charrette and all the planning? Is this parking along the lines with the plans that look so amazing? Yes, this was in the charrette, uh, where we are with the charrette. So that was adopted last year by the council. Mm -hmm. We've negotiated and entered into a, um, uh, Cindy, what was it, like a $120,000 contract for somebody to come in and completely rewrite our land development code. Wonderful. Wrapping around that charrette. Are so. you still planning to do a big building on that empty land near... Um, the river walk that I think would have parking underneath, housing and businesses or something. It was that was, was that was presented. Building. That that was done in coordination with the owner. And uh -huh. the the issue is maybe uh, the, just the the price of construction right now just stopped. It's insane. Tracks. Yeah. So it just stopped. Okay. He was because I, I thought that that was they did a masterful job with the master plan. There, yeah. So I I just was curious where the parking was going. And things are st we're starting to hear people come in more. We're, we're mm -hmm. starting to hear others that are wanting to invest in Crystal River on like boutique hotels and things. Cool. Public safety. Th this this is huge. So when I got here, the the city had a a uh, we call them the park rangers, and he's basically a water park ranger. He was a guy in a boat, no gun, no badge, no authority. You guys remember, probably remember Roger. He would just go out there and, and excuse, don't write this in the minutes, but he'd piss people off, and there's nothing he could, they could do about it. He just drove around. He just drove around. So I, I quickly realized, hey, we got to fix that. So so we went through a, a reduction in force and used that money to hire a full-duty officer with a gun and a badge that's got authority out there. And right now the city's paying about $120,000 a year just in law enforcement salaries basically babysit the tourists that are out there. I mean, it was not needed before the before all these tours, all this tourism came in. Um, it's getting worse and it's really, it's not enough. So Jake is out, Jake's our new water officer. He's writing, I'm, I think the number was three times as many tickets as all of the other Marine units combined in, in the, in the um, sheriff's office as far as for the water enforcement. And that's not because he's he's a bad guy. He's a really good guy. He's just there's that much of a need for it on Crystal River, especially during the holiday weekends. So Jake's out there only he's on the water about 30 hours a week because, you know, he's got to do administrative stuff for 10 of it. So it's not a whole lot of time for him to be out there. So we sure could use some help with that. I know there's some carve outs in the statute for public safety. I don't know if we fit within that because I don't think we're big enough, but um, I've got some ideas to solve that later. We're also paying additional off-duty details just in hot spots. So Hunter Springs Park and Pete's Pier, uh, excuse me, don't write this down, but it's a shit show on the weekends. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's really, really bad. So we have to hire. Is that a technical term? Yeah, it okay. is. No, it's, it's, I'm, I'm pretty passionate about it. You can tell. It's you, accurate. The, 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 the residents don't even want to bring their kids down there on the weekends. It's just so crowded and so unruly. Um, and until we can get a hold on the capacity issue there, we're, we're going to be stuck with this. So we're paying, what is it, about $10,000 a year, I think, just just for off-duty deputies to be out there. And, you know, people look at me, it's like the sheriff's department should be doing that. It's like, well, we, we hire a city resource officer and city units to take care of the city residents. So this, I, I don't want to devote them out here when there's a lot of other things they need to be doing. So this is, this is one that I think we could really partner on. It's a consolidated, consolidated educational plan for the ecotourism community. There's a bunch of 
videos out there. There's Manatee Manors. The city's working on one for our kayak vendors. Um, there's, there's ones that are needed for teaching just people how to interact with manatees, just how to drive a motorboat. I mean, if you're out there on the weekends, good luck get in front of one of these guys. So maybe that's something that we could work with together on is a consolidated effort where we've got one uniform look and feel of, of several videos that kind of match. So um, I know um, we are in the middle of doing a new promotional video for kayaks because we promised that to the kayak vendors. So we owe them that. So we got to get ahead of it. Fish and Wildlife, they are looking at updating Manatee Manors. Uh, however, they got to study it for about three years before they decide <laughs> what to do. So they are moving forward to that, but it's the federal government, and they got they 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 move at a whole different speed than we all do. So, but there's no comprehensive approach underway. Boat launch upgrade. Th this one really got me going. So all of the West Side public boat launches are well beyond capacity, and you heard from a previous speaker. Don't close down boat launches. Uh, we, me, I had approached the county administrator, previous county administrator, with a concept of partnering with the city where the city was going to come in, lead the charge, be the project manager, get a grant to do the design and permitting for an upgrade at the Hunters, at the Hunters, at um, a Port Island Trail boat ramp. If anybody's been out there, there's a big ditch right through the middle of that property that's man-made. It's void of all any ecological value. My thoughts are is fill that ditch in. Put it back to the way it was before and, and put more parking out there and maybe some more dock space. I was quickly pushed back with resistance from county staff at the time. So I just dropped it. I don't know it. if you saw, but our county administrator walked in about 20 minutes ago. Yeah. Yes. I'm, I'm not talking about yes. so. <laughs> I know. Steve I know. and I have talked about it. No, yeah. and, and, and Steve, Steve was all on board with it. So, and this is just things that I think we could really partner with. Now, I'm not mm -hmm. going to be at the city for too much longer. I, I will be a consultant, so maybe you can pay me to do this. But... No, you can't. But that's good. <laughs> uh, there's been no action since, and it's it's not because we don't want to. It's just we've only we got a lot on our plate, and it's just trying to pick and choose what's what's the most important. But this this is something that the TDC could really take with. There's there's a lot of money out there for design and permitting. Hundred percent of the cost paid for upgrades comes out of FWC, and then there's a. Um, a federal boating and fish grant that's available that would pay for 75 percent of cost of construction of a facility like this and you can use the local fwc money as a match so basically about i'm guessing about on 10, 10 cents of the dollar if, if you talk, if you put the program together right this is something you could do uh, maintenance of the kings bay restoration that is so that that's the issue i talked about where two things need to take place is, is the state is paying uh, St. Crystal River via sea and shoreline a ton of money to go out there and both Homosass and Crystal River, they're sucking up the Langbia, they're planting eel grass, and that bay has looked better than I think I've ever seen in the past 50 years. It's, it's fantastic. The issue is two things. They need, it needs initial maintenance, which is not paid for by the state. So they have to go in for the first couple of years and suck all the uh, the lingvia that's got on the cages for the eelgrass before they can take the cages off and maybe maybe a little bit of spot dredging of some spots they missed but the big thing is is that eelgrass is floating on top of the water they need to be able to suck that off the top and they, they bought a harvester and it's sitting on off of shats island uh, they just needed the, the, the city and the county need to continue funding that right now the city and the county do have a funding source we do pay into that where they are doing this work I, I would just urge that we continue to do that. The um, the one big issue, and I don't know if y'all can help out. Save, and I'm speaking on their behalf right now. Save, save Crystal River is having tremendous amount of time getting a permit from FWC, same permit that the county holds, to basically remove that material from the top of the water. It's basically harvesting is what it was. The county's got a permit to do that work, which is completely eligible to do this. Um, Save Crystal River wants the same permit, but FWC is pushing back on them pretty hard. We're taking a lobbyist approach to try and address that, but it's 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 a real need, especially if, if you go into a canal that's covered with eelgrass. I think it benefits tourism to get rid of that eelgrass so you can actually see the manatees underneath. Residents, too. And residents. Well, <clears throat> so here's my big ask. Um, I'll just read this. The city of Crystal, and, and this was about into two glasses of gin last night, so I apologize at the time. 
I, what I got you realize you said that out loud, right? I did. Okay. Yeah, so the city of Crystal River is requesting the TDC and county to partner with the city in developing and funding a comprehensive tourism management strategy to include breaking down legislative barriers that may prevent necessary and much needed initiatives. There's been numerous times I've talked to John. Um, hey, hey, John, I got this great idea. He's like, Ken, the legislative statute won't allow it. It's like, well, I'm the kind of guy that's like, hey, if, if the rules don't work, change the rules. So that's, we're willing to work with the TDC and the county. If, if we got to go after any legislative changes to make this work, we'll do it. So, and that's all I got. Any questions? Michael, anything? That's pretty comprehensive. Again, getting back to what we can, what we can't, where it comes from, what's done. We should charge more for everything and then less people come. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I keep coming back to. Everybody just needs to charge more and it'll reduce some of the traffic. We're still one of the greatest still, values in the state of Florida. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In every aspect. I mean, what is, Mike, what does it cost to swim with the dolphins at SeaWorld? 150 No. Oh, it's more than that. It's more than like that. 350 I think. Well, Keys. put it this way. We went up, uh, I took a group up to Georgia Aquarium. So it was whale sharks in an aquarium. It was four fifty for divers and three fifty for snorkelers. What's the average cost of our snorkeling trip? For an hour, an hour total, including gear and up. Well, they finally bumped it up. The Most average people. for Manti Tour, my guess is probably about sixty five right now. I think I may be the highest priced in town. I'm not positive what you guys are running, and I'm at eighty five. But there's folks out there that are still in the fifties. I mean, dollar wise. And you're spending hours with them. And we're spending three hours, three hours on a small boat with two crew members. Yeah. But a, a dolphin watch in Pensacola or the Keys, you're paying 100 bucks for 90 minutes with 30 of your closest friends on the boat. And you're so, not getting in the water. And you're the not dolphins. getting in the water. So, boat ramp fees yeah, around so, the state. Yes, so much uh, I'm echoing Mike's, Michael's point. You know, industry tourism here is way underpriced. Um, I'll, I'll, yeah, I, I agree. How many years ago I charged 75 a head, and that was eight years ago? And, and, and prices have not gone up. I just don't understand why. But um, back to the tourists, the kayakers in our area. Uh, Ken and I went to a FWC meeting about the closure of Three Sisters and, and what they're doing there. You didn't have that picture where the people were climbing up on no. the shore, right? <laughs> so, um, you know, Ken and I were very much attacked by local citizens um, that we're not controlling these kayakers better and we just don't have the resources for it. And we were under fire in that meeting, like, why aren't you doing, why aren't you? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, we, we can't spend taxpayer money to, you know, monitor what the tourists are doing. And yeah, they're aggravated. You saw the pictures of just clusters of tourists on kayaks and the locals on their boats can't even get through them. And so we've implemented, with some of our funds, signs, kayakers to the left, boats to the right, and it's somewhat working, but it's really imperative that we work on this Kings Bay Park with education and really hammer in um, some better manners of the kayakers that are coming to our area. You know, I've been witness to these kayakers pulling up right to the shoreline at Three Sisters where it says, do not tie to the trees, First thing they do is tie to the trees, they get up out of the water, they're on the shore, and they are problematic and one of the reasons I think that we're having to go through this restoration pro project is because of the tourists are just, they have bad manners and we've got, we've got to rein them in somehow. Yeah. I'll let the sawgrass. They're not doing that. They're not doing sawgrass? No, I asked that. No, that's not correct. They're not putting sawgrass up there. That's the choice that they were. No, and I asked at the meeting. The, the people with mud that are actually doing this, that is not in their project. Oh. You were there, right? Oh, yeah. I asked. Oh, that's and, a shame. And, and well, just, that's swift money. And I don't, I don't want this to come across wrong because it's this is not what I mean, but it's right now it's like we got a really good city council that, that recognize that we need to work together to solve this mm -hmm. and because the tourists are here. But it's, you know, we're a really small city, and, and you, you could get a city council up there that says, hey, we don't want kayak launches out of our city parks anymore and put a halt to it. That's 80% of the kayak launches are coming out of our parks. So that would just kill that industry. So I, I'm just, it, it's, it's a delicate balance. And, and as these residents are getting more and more upset, I think we need to listen to them. And, and 
I've, s- I've seen this train coming for a while because yeah. my parents still live on the river and I hate going out on the weekends. I just won't do it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But so. to, to you know, echo the comments or reinforce, you know, Ken's presentation, I, I was out over the weekend on a, a boat and I, I just cruised around. One, the back half of Magnolia, you could not go in. It was so much eel grass on there. It was the way the winds were blowing and all the eel grass blew back into Magnolia Gator Hole, whatever you want to call it this week. Um and then on the tourist and in behavior, there's a boat anchored outside of Three Sisters. And when we went past, there were two people on the boat, yeah, doing their thing. We came back, there's two swimmers coming out of Three Sisters. So I said, oh, how were the springs? <laughs> and the guy says, oh, we can't answer that. And then he says, well, I've been swimming there for 20 years. They're so not going to tell me I can't. Yeah. So, I mean, when so that, that's on the local side. Um, this is now that it's closed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, actually, actually, that was yesterday. Oh, wow. Um, okay. and, and then <coughs> the, five minutes later, there's a gentleman swimming down, chasing a manatee around the canal outside of Three Sisters. His girlfriend ties her kayak off to one resident's house, walks along the yard to the neighbor's dock, and jumps in from the other neighbor's dock. So yes, I mean, it, it's some of its residents and attitudes. I've been doing it for twenty years, and some of it is definitely tourism. But the behavior and education is sorely needed, and a you know a comprehensive approach um, is definitely needed. My favorite was this. My favorite, but we see a lot of favorites. But <laughs> so over the weekend, there, there's this group. There's there's five kids that go around on a little skiff with bow and arrows, shooting bow and arrows at fish, which is completely legal. They can do that, but they're going right by Manatee Tour, shooting arrows right, <laughs> <laughs> and it's completely legal. So there's it's it, there's like you said there's there's a train wreck coming. So we we really need to work together on this. Let me just state one thing to go back to changing the rules and all that other good stuff. I look at this a little bit as we own a theme park, okay? The county, Pretty much. Mm-hmm. Yeah. the county is a theme park, right? And so there's always a balance between we have to keep the marketing engine going so we can't divert too much of it to improving our theme park. However, I do think that a certain amount of it, it just has to be that balance has to go into the destination management versus the destination marketing because we are, it is really coming to a head in Crystal River. Um, Not as much in Inverness yet, but you guys want more attention I'm not sure you do based on this, <laughs> just saying. But um, so that's that's what I'm feeling on that sort of thing. But I love breaking down silos, breaking down um, stupidity in government. You know, the right hand doesn't know what the left hand's doing and not working together. And that's what I love that spirit of it. So it'll be good. Okay. Do you want to go back to the original slide with just the rundown real quick and... Prioritize, maybe. I did not put these in any particular order. Um, and there's actually a couple more on there I took off, but um, it, it, it wasn't worthy of talking about. But Can I, in, in the interest of not having this board meeting run too long, I want to keep this fast, but can we run down one by one what is legal for us to do and not? Um, I will ask, uh, I had a couple of questions that, before I started popping in with questions throughout the kayak facility, I assume you can bond some of that income for the three million. We're not gonna we're not gonna borrow money. No. We will not borrow money. We'll we'll spend the cash that we acquire from. We will spend the cash that we get from the industry. Okay. I wasn't saying to bond all of it. I'm saying yeah, that no. if you if you're a little bit short. Um, the reason I say that, since there was applause from the audience on that. Is that that's some, my staff? Sometimes, no, it, no, it wasn't. <laughs> no, it wasn't. <laughs> sometimes it is wiser when you are building out something. It is more cost effective to get it done now and get it done right. And if you can get ninety percent of the way there, bonding the last ten yeah. percent is probably a fiscally wise decision. Yeah, be, um, be on, if, if if we're going to bond anything, it's going to be a new city hall. That's that's where we use mm-hmm. our bonding capacity, and as a yep. new city hall that the residents can use. Yep. Um, restroom. So the other thing I was wondering is if you are able to end up closing the Hunter Springs Park for, 
um, for at 500 or whatever the capacity is? Are you going to have some sort of elect, you know, attractive electronic sign outside of that area, maybe to say it's either full or not, so people don't get down that dead end road and try to figure out parking and then get there most, and it's closed? Most okay. likely the residents are going to demand that. Are the residents um, going to be allowed to go for free? Yep. Okay. That should hopefully get around any challenge, legal challenge mm -hmm. down downstream. Um, so... John, do you want to go down one by one and just say what, what is legal and what's not? I think it's easier to, there's three that I don't think we can do, right? That, and everything else would probably need research. I don't think we can do just parking because it's not connected to um, a facility or something. I think, uh, like if you were to build uh, like, a, like a gym, you know, an auditorium or one of the statutory, right? the Coliseum is one of the words. You can attach, you can build out the parking to that, uh, but just regular parking, I don't think it can, I don't think that can be done. The two law enforcement things, Ken's right, that's that's in the statute that it's very specific to which counties can do it. So those are, those, those two are out. Uh, everything else I, I think a case could be made for. Um, I'm not sure about dredging, but I know there's areas that, have beach re-nourishment and things so that's maybe but um i tell you there, there's been precedent set on the dredging and yeah. it was this very board that did it back in the 90s at king's bay so okay. I, I said it's hey, like i said that that the rest of them some of them don't take that much research i mean i think you can the the restroom expansion would be relatively easy in terms of of making the case um yeah, the facility as well, I think, could, I mean, you know, well, the relative. The kayak, kayak facility, I mean, it's it's a safety issue. Sure. I mean, we've got kind of Jurassic launches right now, and, you know, these people expect more when they come yeah. to visit us. The three million is a heavy lift if you're not going to bond. Yeah, and what was the, the other one? And that, that's, stages, that, that, right? that's, that's for several phases. I think yeah. the, the, fir the first, the really necessary one's a million. Okay. Oh, bad, but we haven't got the final cost estimates. And you have two fifty a year, and in... right now we've we've got stockpiled five hundred. Okay. So we're we're close. Okay. So and you mentioned so I, get, I think you mentioned the one about um, the Four Island Trail. Yes. That since it's an existing park, that there's a there are way there's something in the statute about it, expanding and renovating existing parks. So um, yeah, there's. Like I said, that's the rest. Like I said, the rest of them I think can a case be made for. You're talking about park mm -hmm. impact fees for? No, I just in general, like in the statutes, you can you can enhance and restore, you know, an existing park. I believe is what is covered under one of the authorized uses. So, like I said, since it already exists, you know that one, that one probably could. Make I believe the list. we should be able to. Um, who? who the county does run Fort Island Gulf Beach, right? Mm -hmm. So right. that is one of in our Parks and Rec, right? Yes, yes. So Parks and Rec should be able to use park impact fees for expansion, theoretically. Mr. Howard, yes? Okay. Maybe. Didn't, um, you, didn't you have a, you had a plan all drawn up for the previous administrator? And you were willing to do all the work. Right. I'm not going to be here, so, but yes, <laughs> yeah, that, it needs to be done. Yeah. It needs to be done. Okay. So suffice to say that I definitely believe that the two cities, the county, the TDC, we should all work together, have our legislative ducks in a row, which I think we've done a pretty good job of the last few years, which is good, um, and just work together on figuring out multiple funding sources for various things to improve our product. I really appreciate that. And just one, one parting word before I walk down is you know we, we we i've heard and out of previous members of this board up here it's got to put heads and beds heads and bets and you mm -hmm. know and to me that equates to is direct increase in the number of tourists if you look at the attorney general's opinion i've read a lot of them i'm, I'm an engineer not an attorney but they all end up saying if this governing body finds that it benefits tourism so benefiting tourism just just a cleaner bathroom to me sure as heck benefits tourism mm -hmm. you know so it's just, it has to be a finding of this board. So. 
Awesome. All right. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. Eric, you're up. <laughs> yeah. Well. So. Yeah. So now, Eric. Eric Williams with the City of Inverness will give their presentation. Did your list get longer after you watched that? Oh, actually, it got shorter. <laughs> So many lawyers, no law degrees today. It's okay. Oh, what do I press to get that thing going? She's going to turn it on for you. Oh, just I gotcha. There you go. So when I first made this, I hadn't heard Ken's presentation, so I apologize because now I want to change it from small town done right to small town done right with clean park restrooms. <laughs> <laughs> but let me say that in jest, um, I want to make a point, which I did yesterday with Mike Wright, and then he put it on the internet, which I thought was funny. Parks, whether they're county or city, are not designed to make you money as a government. They are designed to be a pure cost sink. They're designed to provide a service to your residents and to your businesses and, and people that visit, but they're not necessarily in any way, shape or form, typically designed to be tourist destinations. And, and most of the parks I think in Citrus County, and I would say in Inverness, uh, are not designed to be tourist destinations. We've, we've done a great job building parks, but we've also all had our eyes bigger than our stomachs when it comes to parks. I think that's a curse that most municipalities and county governments suffer from. And what I mean by that is exactly what Ken started talking about, which is these parks are beautiful, right? You come to the depot district, man, it's beautiful. People walk around, it's beautiful, Eric. It's a beautiful park. It is. Mm -hmm. Let me show you what it costs to run it. Whispering Pines, beautiful park, regional facility. Let me show you what it costs to run it. I want to give just a moment of recognition to the history of what got us here today and to this conversation without miring in too much detail because uniquely, especially between Ken and myself, who's leaving now because I had to watch all his presentation. You know, we have a lot of history with this subject matter of county and city cooperation, trying to have joint funding, working across the aisle, <clears throat> this is not a new thing. This has been decades. This has been going on a long time. And I'll, I'll just stick to the Inverness piece of it. You know, a lot of, a lot of interesting things happened over the last uh, 15 years as it relates to the city of Inverness and working with county government, especially Whispering Pines Park, uh, and especially with the downtown environment. And Inverness uh, wasn't always the best partner. I think anytime you get into politics, you're going to run into issues where people start taking sides and, and start saying things. Uh, and to Ken's point, I think there was previous folks involved uh, as it relates specifically to this council that sort of had an interesting way with words and assertions as to what was important and what wasn't. So before I go further, I just wanted to kind of get that out there because I think that's an important point. You know, Inverness has spent millions and millions of dollars in the last 10 years really redoing uh, its lakefront park system, uh, the Valerie Theater, really finishing the downtown redevelopment. But then there's been Whispering Pines Park, which we don't own. We don't own Whispering Pines Park. It's owned by the state of Florida. It's part of the state forest system. And it's been in the city's tutelage for 40 some odd years. And it's in need of a few things. <clears throat> it's a beautiful park. Uh, just one best of the best, as I understand from the Chronicle again. And it, it has people that come from all over the state. It's a regional facility. But before I get to that, which ones go forward, up or down? Right. Big button. Oh, the big button. Wow. Love it. I'm going to throw some order of magnitude numbers out there um, because I think that's important for you all to be able to gauge your conversation. And I want to be very clear. We're not asking for any exacting consensus or decision today. We're sparking a conversation because this won't ever get hashed out or discussed at this meeting into the degree that it would need to be brought back as a final item, in my opinion. You know, Destination management and marketing is a big deal now in Citrus County. Um, it didn't used to be as much. I don't think you had the issues that you have today in front of us, and I'll blame COVID for a lot of it. Um, COVID really focused attention to Citrus County. It really did. People said, man, I can come here. I can get my free money that fell out of the sky from the federal government and go buy a boat, a kayak, a new truck, and I can go stay over there and pay $60 to see the manatees. I can go to Inverness and do all this free stuff. Man, I'm doing that. And we literally saw our numbers jump through the roof. A little history on the city's events and uh, visitors plan. Uh, we broke away from the idea of a countywide philosophy probably in 2013, in my opinion. 
And when that happened, we kind of started our own little deal. And we were spending a lot of money. We were spending three quarters of a million dollars a year to basically put on 14 events. Okay, the mainstay things like Cooter Fest, Patriotic Evening. And along came COVID. And we really had to rethink what we were doing because of two things. One, we had just opened the depot district and it was very expensive to run. And two, the cost of staff rose quickly. If you didn't remember all the minimum wage conversations that went on in the state of Florida, they were pretty fast and furious. But Inverness took a step back because one of the things that we did, in my opinion, poorly at, maybe it was a necessary evil to do, was we wanted to control every aspect of everything. We wanted to be the people that did the event. We did this. We told you how to do that. You put your tent here. You put your chair there. This is what it needs to be. Here's the artist. And that wasn't sustainable for a city of 7,200 people. So we took a, an approach where we started to bring in investors to put on events. And we did that uh, largely to be able to reduce our annual cost footprint uh, and also free up our staff and also get far more events for far less money. And today we put on over 100 free events. Those are city-driven events. That doesn't count all the other events that other people come in and do on their own, like Made for the Trades nights. Uh, if, if a nonprofit, you know, Way comes in and does something, if the YMCA does something, that, those are not included in that. These are just events that we do in partnership with uh, what I call, have coined our partners or, or our investors. Uh, things like uh, Patriotic Evening now, Big Bass Bluegrass and Barbecue, Light Up the Lake, Festival of the Arts. Th this is just a snippet. You know, what isn't on this list is all the car shows, all the free uh, tower tunes, all the teen nights, all the movies in the parks, that all those things are not on this list. But I do think it's important to understand that people are now coming to those events uh, from outside of our area. You know, we know that we're out conducting, you know, on, on foot surveys, talking to people. Uh, we can tell by the interaction that we have on social media. You know, it's starting to draw people here, which is great. You know, Dr. Desai built a new hotel. We we're very happy about that. We hope it fills up all the time. Um, but it, we really are starting to see an, an enormous amount of attention, which we want. Let me be clear. We'll take some of Ken's problems over at the city all day long. That, that, that's okay. We've overbuilt. Uh, and we, we have the capacity to deal with it uh, on the basis by which we put these events on, which really generally targets towards the end of the week and the weekend. So we have that ability to do it. We've also taken a huge focus to cultural arts, which is unique. Because that's something that I would say community-wise across the county was there, but, you know, really hadn't dug hard into it, really hadn't invested big into it. Now we're starting to see uh, massive interest in it, not only from a perspective of, of art itself, the murals, sculptures, uh, art shows, people wanting to do, you know, art exhibits in the town, uh, but also from live performances. The Valerie Theater now, uh, I can't get a reservation at the Valerie Theater. I mean, it's, it's booked up. I mean, it, it literally is booked up. It's small. So, you know, is that hard to do? Uh, we weren't doing it for a lot of years, but now we are. Uh, it, but it's really cool because a lot of cool people have come there. I mean, we've brought famous people there. Uh, but the thing that I think is really neat is when we have local uh, play groups that do a show and we see where the ticket sales come from. I mean, it's all digital. You know, we see where they <laughs> come from. People are coming from out of town to come to these shows. I mean, it's really unique. I mean, they, they don't know that so-and-so that's in Citrus Hills as part of this play group and put it on and they just buy a ticket and go to it. And, and that's, that's really a cool thing. I, I think that's really interesting. And, you know, our depot pavilion, uh, when we do that market at the depot now, arguably I would tell you that's probably uh, the largest market of its type in Central Florida. I mean, it, it is huge. Um, and it's really cool because a lot of people come from all over for that. But none of this operates for free. And, you know, we spend uh, a quite a bit of money in marketing, creating digital content, um, you know, and, and those are things that as when I look at this number of 150,000 beyond the things that Ken's accentuating, which I think are important, you know, the two cities and, and Inverness uh, really, you know, an infusion of, of money annually on a reoccurring basis. Maybe that goes to things that are there now, but in our case, we want to make sure that it goes to things that aren't there now that we want to expand and keep doing more of because our small business community in Inverness is doing better than it's ever done. And it, there are big features to what is on this slide that is why that is happening. You know, we walk the mile legislatively to create an entertainment district. Our small town Saturday night, it, it's unbelievable that two or 3,000 people show up 
on a Saturday night there. I mean, that, that's incredible in, in Inverness. Um, I would tell you that there's a lot of tertiary economic effect to small businesses that would come from funding like that that help keep a sustainability and a repeatability economically, not only in Inverness, but as those people leave from Inverness that weekend, they, they go to Crystal River, Homosassa, Floral City. Uh, they, they go all over the place, and that, that's a cool thing. So let's just kind of look at what some of this looks like, right? Because a picture is worth a thousand words. I know I'm still not going to use the bathroom over at Hunter Springs after <laughs> Ken showed me that. Well, he um, was leaving to go. Oh, is he? That's where it's going. Nice. Actually, Ken and I got together this morning and trashed that bathroom just so we could have that picture. Man. <laughs> I'm kidding. We wouldn't, we wouldn't do that. That, that wouldn't that, be right. Is that before or after the gym? Uh, yeah. <laughs> no comment. Uh, I'm going to miss Ken when he's gone. I was telling him today. You know, Ken's res resignation for me is sort of sad because he was like one of the last people that had been here a long time that I get to play with at, at work. You know, he's a good guy, but um, it is a little sad for me. But let's look at some of these pictures. You know, these are crowds that are here in Inverness on a regular basis. And they're things that we repeat. Um, the town is beautiful. People love to come and walk and be part of it. Uh, and there's a high level of diversity between the type of activities that you can do. You know, I think um, as, as you look at some of our bigger events, you know, we're putting thousands and thousands and thousands of people. One of my favorite pictures is the one in the bottom left there. Uh, <laughs> you got 10,000 people in that park and then try count all the boats that are out on the lake. Um, it, it's really unique. And every one of those people will spend money. Every single one of them will spend money. You know how I know all those people aren't from Inverness? Just take a guess. Not that many people live in Inverness. <laughs> There's not that many registered boats <laughs> on the lake uh, and, and they're spending money. And I agree wholeheartedly with what Ken says. And I think that that metric of heads and beds, <clears throat> let me tell you, there's a dispelling nature to heads and beds. Do you want the same head and the same bed each year? Do you want the people that just come from to Scallop that have been coming here for 15 years that have figured out, man, it's cheaper for me to take my whole family get a room at the plantation, have eight people in it. We'll bring a cooler and all eat ham sandwiches so we don't go out to eat. And that room won't be available maybe for someone that comes from out of town that wants to scallop that isn't going to do that, that's going to go to all the restaurants. I think you have to look deeper than just the heads and beds effect of, of where it benefits tourism. Because sometimes you got to get a tourist here two or three times to want to stay the night. You know, I go to Orlando quite a bit on business. And uh, I hate staying in Orlando, um, but I think sometimes I do. And it's interesting to me that people will stay here. And I talk to folks all the time. They'll stay here and say, well, you know, I, I live over in Sumter County. It was just nice to spend the weekend. Now, it probably took them four or five times coming here, doing something to get that effect. And the heads and beds equation of being able to count the, the bed stays on, on a single issue in my, in my opinion, from an analytic standpoint, you, you got to be careful with that because I think sometimes you need to get people over and over again. It's like dating, you know? You just don't go to holding hands on the first date, right? So one other thing about this picture is we brought in a lot of investors. None of the events you see here, uh, these big events, all require big dollars. You know, that event in the lower left, you know, that's a hundred plus thousand dollar event that the city only had a 20, 20 some odd thousand dollars in. And we're not out captivating that additional money other than people coming and wanting to invest, which in the same respect is what I look at as the TDC's involvement uh, in an annual appropriation to what Inverness does on its destination management and marketing each year. You know, we look at you all as a partner and investor, just, just like the other folks that we have, like Dale McClellan, who this year came very strong with Big Bass, Bluegrass and Barbecue, brought in, you know, Grammy Award winning artists, um, you know, this it's a good thing. It brought diversity in music that people had never seen before here at that level, which was really a cool thing. So let's let's take it a step further. You know, beyond the events, we get half a million visitors a year just to interact with that trail and depot district area. Um, that trail is amazing. And the economy around it, we love it. We love the economy around it. I would love to have a bike launch problem to where, you know, we're having to deal with that. I mean, that would make me happy. <laughs> Buy a kayak, get a free bike. You know what I mean? I could make that happen. We could do that. We should work on that. Yeah. TDC could buy the bikes. You get the kayakers. Oh, no. 
But let's also talk about why this number's coming up. Again, I, COVID. I always try to take the positive out of COVID. People started focusing on more healthy living, more outdoor type activities, not being inside. Um, and interestingly enough, we saw a great uptick in the amount of interest in doing things like cycling and running events. Uh, Inverness is a designated trail town. Uh, anyone who follows the city will know that we have a hyper focus in our, in our capital improvements to building that multimodal connectivity around the town. Uh, largely, one of the big projects that we have in front of the state legislature now deals with the West Inverness Trail, which back in 2013 14 involved working with the county to get a piece of property to make that happen. So, after 11 years, we're going to probably hopefully see that happen. But this is a big deal. People come here every day to Inverness to enjoy this. They have a big problem. There's nowhere to stay. They always ask, where, where do I stay? Where do I stay? Thankfully, we now have two hotels in the city, um, but we drive them constantly to Lakanto, to Crystal River, to wherever that we can tell them there's a hotel. We, we always want to get them into Citrus County first. But oddly enough, you'd be surprised the percentage of people that are in uh, this sport, as I call it, um, that are living out of vans, RVs, that's, that, those two things are joined at the hip. That's a big deal. Um, and Inverness is really lacking uh, in RV spaces uh, for, for folks like this to stay. We end up having nice, polite conversations with them when they're you know, spending the night in the parking lot. But we always try and accommodate, um, and we see that as a, as a big circumstance. When we do these cycling events, uh, the big thing the promoters all want to know is, where can we camp people? Where can we tent camp them? Where can we RV camp them? Where, 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 where can we do that? There, there's whole businesses now built around glamping that just follow these events around and these folks will pay hundred plus dollars a night to have to these companies to set them up and move their bikes and stuff around to each stage of a ride. It's a pretty interesting situation to say at least. So let's talk about another order of magnitude number. I'm going to keep my numbers lower than Ken's in an effort to entice you away <laughs> from Crystal River. He's playing on his phone. <laughs> He just has ignored me after all this time. He knows, he knows better. Like if I give him attention, he'll just keep doing it. Um, don't die on the $2 million number. Let that be something that's in your head. It's not something we're saying, hey, uh, Commissioner Davis, you got the briefcase of money back there. We'll, we'll, we'll take a million now and I'll come back next month and get the other. There's a couple of things that I would tell you that we don't, we don't really see uh, any need for a partnership capital-wise at the moment from the TDC specifically as it relates to our downtown park facilities in the depot district. We've, we've done a, a fairly yeoman's job of, of investing in that heavily and they're sort of where they need to be. There's a few things that need to change, but I don't, would not view those as augmenting uh, a tourism perspective. But Whispering Pines Park's a little unique. There's some cool things happening there that is sort of a, a perfect storm coming together. You know, if you're familiar with the park, you know that it's bordered, it's 300 acres and it's bordered on uh, two sides by 44, uh, Highway 44 and Highway 41 North, which are uh, SIS roads of the state. And the main entrance to the park is off of Forest Drive, which is, is pretty much a local road. Um, this park sees uh, just under 200,000 uh, unique visitors a year. Um, most of those visitors uh, are local but we see a number of visitors, especially now that we have certain things going on at the park that are starting to come from out of town and in a regional area. So one of the big things that we're working on, and this is not something we necessarily see the TDC being involved with financially, is a new entrance at the park. I bring it up because it's important to the marketability, uh, the access to the park, but Highway 41 North is being widened in front of the park, along the park. As part of that, we negotiated with the state to get a new entrance um, I'm getting arrested. That's okay. No, it's, okay. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. I got my bail right here. Um, you know, the widening of the highway and this new entrance is going to be a big deal because really access to the park, if you don't know the park's there and how to get to it, it's kind of tricky to get there. Um, but this new entrance would be signalized. The state's already agreed to the stub out. Um, I will tell you that I believe the state's going to be the primary partner with the city on funding not only the entrance, but the road into the park. So we're, we, we bring this to your attention, not to have you participate necessarily in funding of it, but that you're aware of it because it's important to the things that we want to talk about as a potential partnership uh, with the TDC. So let's talk about uh, sports tourism. 
Well, let's talk about um, you know competitive uh, baseball, travel ball. Uh, it, this is big business in Florida. It's big business. It's big business in other states too, by the way. Um, and we don't have a facility any longer that keeps up with the Joneses anywhere in Citrus County for this, to be quite candid with you. Um, and we just, some of that is a space thing. Some of that's a location thing. Um, some of it's just, there hasn't been a plan brought together to do kind of thing. Um, Whispering Pines uniquely is located in an area that's close to so many things. So looking to do some level of a, a tournament complex there uh, has a lot of viability. Uh, and, and, and I really believe that we already are seeing that uptick now at the city. We're, we're getting more travel ball tournaments, AAU. We're getting more uh, non-baseball related type uh, tra things there than we ever have before. But between softball, baseball, and, and this year we'll be hosting the Florida Senior Games, which is like a senior citizen Olympics type thing. Um, you know, there's a lot of attention and interest in Whispering Pines. We get asked the question all the time, when are you going to redo these ball fields if you can just get these ball fields redone? I will tell you, the city has not invested in Whispering Pines heavily in terms of capital improvement for, for a couple of reasons, but the main one is we don't own it. It'd be like me going to your house and saying, let me build a garage on your house, and then you promise to let me call it mine forever and ever, amen. You know, there has to be, there's a cautious tale there. Do I think the state of Florida would ever take it away? Nope. I can tell you just in negotiating with them, offering them to take it back, and they're like, tell you what, we'll give you whatever you want. Um, the park is, is just getting, showing its age. But I think an investment for uh, sports tourism in Citrus County, this is the place it could happen. This is the place it would have a high return. This is the place that has all the restaurants around it. This has the place that the families that may come here can go do things immediately, not only within the town, but they can travel back and forth to Homosassa, Crystal River, uh, so forth and so on. Um, I think that you're going to see that Whispering Pines is going to continue to grow as a regional facility uh, beyond uh, the athletic fields. I mean, it's got amazing uh, hiking trails, you know, Junior Olympic swimming pool, a racquetball, tennis, splash pad. It, it's an amazing place. Um, I had the pleasure yesterday of doing a two and a half hour uh, filming and taping uh, with Bay, with Spectrum Bay News 9. They, they're running, a, they want to do a story, not sure when it's going to come out. I think it may be this weekend or next week that focuses on, you know, the city's look to Whispering Pines and where it would look to get partnerships from folks like yourself in the state of Florida. Yep. Um, is there any way, since the state owns it, is there any way for us to use impact fees at all? Yes, you can. We, we have done that in the past. Okay. Without question, that can happen. You know, really, I think the state owns it thing has been, is more of an excuse than a tangible reason, if that makes sense. It has to be for expansion, not correct. Re, not renewing. I'm just stating this for the public. It, it can't be renewal of existing facilities. It has to be expansion. But the portion that is expansion could you believe be funded by impact fees? Absolutely, because okay. anything we do to those ball fields is going to be to expand the capacity of what they can handle, mainly in yeah. seating, dugouts, you know, it, those kind of things have to happen. The ball right. fields themselves, several of them need to be made just a, a skosh bigger. But the good news is we've got all the land in the world out there to do it. Uh, and the other piece of this is the city has had a great partnership with uh, the folks that own it, the state, for many years. We're just now finishing our 10-year management plan update with them, and we've included all this as a potential opportunity. Doesn't mean it has to happen, just means that we're in the process to do it. So let's get to the thing that I think uh, Whispering Pines is in desperate need of. Whispering Pines Park is basically, for all intents and purposes, absent the athletic fields, akin to a, a, a complex state park facility. It really is. Uh, I think if you go talk to the folks at the, that manage the state parks, the first thing they're going to tell you where they get all their money from is campgrounds and RV parks. That's where they make their money. They don't make their money by people paying, you know, three bucks, four bucks to go in and walk the trails. They make their money off of um, overnight stays. They always have and they always will. Um, it, it's something that people want to do. People look at Florida as a huge destination for RVing. Uh, it's, a, it's a big business. It's six billion in the state alone. In our congressional district, it's 159 million. Just in our congressional district. I mean, it, it's a big deal. There's more 
uh, attention to RVs for overnight stays in Citrus County than there are uh, hotels. By far and away. The thing about RVing is you don't do it if you don't have money. <laughs> That's not possible. You know, you're targeting an audience that has money to spend. You know why? Because they already spent money to get the thing there. But Whispering Pines Park is a unique location and the ability to couple an overnight stay RV park facility within that park and at the same time have the connectivity back to the economy of the downtown, back to the economy of travel ball, to the features that are available in the park to use, and people's ability to go back and forth to other areas of the county to experience things is second to none. Now, we're not looking to compete with private RV facilities. This type of facility would be akin to a state park that is not going to be sit there for three, four months. It's, that, that's not how this would be. And it would not be something that I would advocate as a large facility, 100 to sub 100 spaces, which is a very small RV facility. But you'd be surprised the cash flow that that generates. And you know, beyond the TDC, the county currently makes a $300,000 annual appropriation to the park's budget. It, it, there's a whole backstory that we don't have two days to talk about with that. But what I will tell you is that doesn't cover half the cost of the park. The city still puts in uh, an additional, let's say $400,000 just on the O&M side, doesn't include capital. And both of those monies are coming from taxpayers. It's coming right out of the general fund of the county government and the city government. And you're seeing a lot more utilization. And, it's, and should this business uh, idea move forward as it relates to travel ball and an RV facility, you may be able to avail those general fund commitments in totality just off this investment. What is your math on, you said 100 spaces times what level of even capacity if, times? Even if you did $50 a night mm -hmm. and you just ran those numbers, you're, you're over a million bucks. And, and here's the other self-service benefit. RV spots pay bed tax. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a great, you want to ever pump money into an investment that's a twofold helping the old government back out and the taxpayers out? Well, that happens to be probably a double down one if you ever saw, because not only are you going to be able to avail those costs that are on the general fund annually, you're going to be able to create a revenue stream that directly gets back into uh, your your coffers. Now, understandably, I'm not sure the TDC would go buy land and build an RV park somewhere. Okay, um, but this is clearly within the guide, guise, of my opinion, of park expansion and amenities enhancements. There's parks all over the place to do this. Um, I think you know there's always a creativity in the eyes of the law, um, but. I would tell you that uh, this is something that we feel pretty strongly is, is doable. Um, and we, we really see it as a way to help free up cash that doesn't need to be spent by the taxpayers of Inverness and or the county today, which, which is really the driving force behind it. It also helps augment and set off the sports tourism philosophy uh, more, more than anything. Quick question, Eric. Oh, sure. Uh, I love who, quick questions. You said that... Um, it would be akin to a state park. Would the city be managing mm -hmm. it, the state or a private company? It's akin in terms of what it looks like and how it operates. The city would operate it. Okay. You know, and it, there's not, these aren't difficult parks to operate, especially because they're pretty self-user driven. You get a campground host that's, you know, staying down here for a period of time, and, and they typically run your day to day. The benefit of Whispering Pines is there's a huge economy of scale. You don't have to build any other amenities. It's already sitting there. One of the big costs in RV park development is all of the amenities. If you ever talk to an RV park developer, the, they, they're, the amenities are the last thing they want to think about. It's how many spaces can I get in, and if there's enough room for this little pool, let's make that happen. Uh, the benefit to Whispering Pines is the, you know, the carts you know, outpace the horse. So we've, we've got tons of amenities that we don't have to go pay and build and have. They're, they're sitting there. And the amenity of the connectivity to the downtown is huge. Uh, as well as, the, I think, the connectivity to the county. Second question, too. Is, I see here that the Florida Trail is there on the left-hand side mm -hmm. of that map. Would there be um, tent camping and connectivity to the trail as well for hikers? So we already have tent camping in Whispering Pines. It's not something we advertise heavily because we're really not ready to be in the business of it whole hog yet. <laughs> but we do have a facility there for that. Um, the West Inverness Trail that will connect through the park <laughs> 
and I don't want to get too far ahead of the Florida Trail, but let, let me say this, it's not a certainty, but they will shift that Florida Trail to line up with that for the portion that it needs to that goes through the park today, simply because the access to that Florida Trail where it comes in and off of the Withlacoochee State Trail is not the most desirable that they want. And uh, the legislature has a high interest in the West Inverness Trail being constructed, which would be on the west side of the park. And that almost touches that tent camping area. I have a question, Eric. Sure. I, my apologies for never being over there and seeing this. I still need the tour, by the way. But, um, yeah, I'm sorry. But you said there's a, a J.O. size pool there? Yes. It's got so, some age on it, but, yep, it's there. So... My kids were all in swimming, mm -hmm. like unlike like travel ball swimming. We were in hotels freaking twice a month. Yep. Uh, and and with tra I don't know travel balls, swimming goes from like three three all the way up to eighteen years of age, and it's a it's a year round sport. Mm -hmm. I mean, would it be something that the TDC really needs to um, really maybe put more focus on? maybe trying to implement something like your your baseball fields and and really instead of just promoting fishing kayaking manatees and let's say other scalloping well let me say Bicycling. this so one thing i always do and some of you don't know me as well but you know my council and which some of them are here today will tell you m most of the time i want to provoke thought and conversation right there's nothing about this that is painted on a cave in France, and this is how things went when we were growing up. You know, I would tell you that I've had conversations with Commissioner Davis uh, in the past about sports tourism. Mm -hmm. You know, it's there. I mean, all these things are here oh, in our yeah. community, and, you know, you all have to decide where your focus goes. Do I think it? Yes, I think that would be an excellent idea. Do I know exactly how to do it? No. Right. Um, I mean, I know you've got the, the triathlon series, the DRC. We, you know, we they're do. There, they're there, but... You know, kind of like, um, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, what's that city that we used to go to? It's, everybody does the runs and stuff on it. The city down in Orlando, Claremont. Claremont, yes. Claremont. They've got that great facility there that brings in tourists from all over for triathlons. We used to go there for swim meets all the time because they did have a nice pool. So I don't know. I mean. Part, part of what I see with putting this in front of you is, is two things. One. If you go back to that 150,000 bucks a year, part of what you get when you bring in partners as investors is, well, I don't know it all, but I get a lot of people around me that know a lot. Uh, and drawing investors in, especially people like DRC, uh, especially other companies that do that kind of work, they start to look at things about your facilities as a government and go, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? You know, that's really been one of our secret sauce deals in the last four years is getting other folks involved that, that can kind of feed us to, to certain elements that we're missing. Um, I most certainly think that there's a market environment and capture that has not happened in Citrus County yet. I think we've kind of tested the waters here and there. But we're a long way from saying we've got that and we've got a, a hold on it. Um, is Whispering Pines a great palette to paint from? 100%. I think it would have to go in a phaseology almost approach. You need some things there. I do think the RV park will start to spark all of the interest in those things very quickly because everybody that comes and stays there is going to go, well, why don't you do something with this? The build it and they will come philosophy doesn't really work as much in government. It, it, right. It's been a something that bureaucrats always use. Listen, I can say that. I mean, I've driven the getaway car on it, so I know exactly how it goes. <laughs> I'm not going to stand here and tell you I didn't, um, but it doesn't work. You, it's not really how it works. Unless you got some shiny object beyond that thing, that they're not coming for the thing. You know, the, it, but I do think that market environment for swimming, uh, for competitive athletics, most certainly. I mean, it's there. The, and, and yes, a focus to marketing for that would be incredible. Part of what we would use any of the dollars that come from you all in an annual appropriation to us is directly broadening our digital marketing. You know, that's a big deal. And it's expensive. And it's difficult to pass it through layers to say, okay, okay, well, TDC, we need you to do this piece, you know, and we'll do this piece. It, every time you add that layer, it just drives the cost. So part of what we want to do is what, what we can reach out to and do very well 
with our facilities without burdening, you know, a, a, a side or a change to your marketing plan that you already have already. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a great point because I definitely think that there's a lot of untouched things that we don't even see yet w without question. The pool, you shut that pool down for a day and I'll show you my email inbox. It's a <laughs> water fitness, mm -hmm. go water fitness. Um, I, I would tell you that think about what we've talked about today. There's not a demand or an ask of, we need this now, We're, we, we can't live without it. Um, what I think, Inverness, I'll speak on behalf of the council, I think what we see more than anything is an opportunity to have a meaningful conversation. Um, I think direction from your board to your staff uh, about how to bring this forward in a, in a touchable way is sort of next step-ish. Um, I know that the County Commission, based on our Leadership Summit conversation, is passionate about seeing this thing go and, and be sort of quick, but nothing quick is good and nothing good is, qu is quick. So I, I would tell you that this is not something that's going to happen overnight. You know, we're, we're looking at this as a, as a long-term visioning that's, you know, what we do. We have a motto at Inverness. It's plan, fund, and execute. You know, it's, it's not execute, then figure out the funding, and then plan how to use it. We did that, too, so we, we know how that story goes. But, you know, this is an opportunity, and I think that it's something that has little to do with where it is in the county versus east versus west, but it's in our county. It's in our community. So all good points. I'd be happy to answer as many questions as you want about this or anything else. <laughs> can I, may I? Yes. Um, Eric, can you go back to the slide that showed the tournaments that were at West Springs Land? Like this? Yeah, uh, exactly. Or this no. one? Yeah, yeah. That the, one. the numbers, yeah. Yeah. I think, if I may share my opinion as a staff member, um, it's hard. Travel travel sports are difficult. Um, having had from my experience at Plantation, they all happen on the weekend, which is when all of our hotels are sold out. So the flip side of this is, if we, if we are able to do this and work together, I think it's a great way to expand those weekend tournaments because it's really hard to find a room a lot of times on the weekends here um so i think that's a good thing i think though that we have to be really careful when we do if we do move forward with this or inverness does however this plays out because if it becomes if, if we we might grow too fast and then going back to like Ken's presentation was this is what the this is what the visitors experiencing they come they get in these tournaments and they they get to go stay in Brooksville because there's nowhere for them to stay, so that's just my opinion. I just remember working at Plantation and being the director of sales over there. It was impossible. We had really hard time um, to to provide the the facilities needed for these travel ball teams. So, but and that's the only word of caution I would give. Yeah, it's a good point. And one back to uh, just touching on a question that you asked uh, Crystal River about borrowing. Um, Inverness would look at the, not because this is reactionary, which I think I, I agree with Ken, borrowing in a reactionary deal to have to do something isn't as intelligent. Um, but this would be an ex true expansion that uh, draws in a market that's not there yet. So borrowing in that instance, as it relates to, you know, bondable streams of money, I wouldn't necessarily bond this because it's not enough money to bond. I mean, if you're not going out and getting 20 or 40 million bucks, stay away from the bond market. But you could, you could reasonably get a committed, you know, small bank loan. And the city would most certainly consider that itself if it embarked on this all on its own because it's revenue generating. You know, and you don't have to commit all the revenues to it, you know, to the debt service. So I, I definitely think that there's a circumstance where we would consider that as well. Would you also consider expanding the RV park in the future to see the need for it? Um, that would be a decision of council, but yeah, but I also think that there's a acquaintance to not doing that. I also think that um, you're going to see more investment in overnight stays in Central Florida in general, and I think that's coming in Citrus County. You know, I really do. Um, and I love people always go, well, that's growth. Well, is it? You know, is it growth? Um, it's people coming and leaving. I think it would spark a lot more interest in investing in different types of redevelopment around Inverness that probably would yield overnight stays. All good questions. So, uh, yes. I just have a comment, not a question. But I, I just feel, and of course, I might be a little partial to Inverness, <laughs> but 
at the same token, we're all in this together. Inverness, Crystal River, we never seceded from the county, even though we're the two official cities. And this is a perfect opportunity to work together to do something that will benefit everybody in the long run. And um, just, the, uh, we've got people regularly from the villages that come over and their one lament is we would, we like to party, but we have to drive back home. But they come to every event, every downtown thing. So we, we're becoming a destination. This will help cement that. Mm -hmm. And it will bring in more tourism tax dollars, which is the whole, whole name of the game here with the TDC. So um, I just encourage everyone to share my thoughts. <laughs> Am I doing the math correctly that if you were at full capacity at $50 a night, we would be getting $250 back a day in bed tax? Yeah, I, I didn't calculate the bed tax. I know what the overall aggregate John, number looks like. John, can you check like. my math real quick? But, it's always fun doing math when you're in the chair seat and you're like doing 10 different things at once. Well, I think you definitely would look at all the analytics of that and what that could be as in terms of a stream of income against debt service or something like that. But you know, this has got... That's at 100% occupancy. Yeah, yeah that's what I said. Two, yeah, $91,000 a year. So you, you'd you have to walk... Well, I was just going by, by day that's full, and you know yeah, you're not going right. to be full every day. That's but. right. For us, we look at... Um, and say you put in a, a million bucks, that's recapitalized in 10 years. You know, that's... Most commercial investments aren't on cap rates like that. Um, I would tell you that this has a long way to go in terms of diligence. The city wants to invest in that diligence, but it wants to see what its potential partnerships are too. Not just with the county, but with the state. Um, I, th I think it's in a great conversation to have because listen, it, these things aren't gonna happen without everybody coming to the mm -hmm. table. They just aren't. And th this yeah. has not come up yet in my time on the board as doing an RV park with impact fees, but I would assume that that would be well, allowable park. use. It's within the park. That's the big difference here. This is a already a park. You're expanding capacity. It's there. The park already has a campground too. So okay, you you there's a lot of ways. So theoretically, to, impact fees could be a part of the. In my opinion, funding. yes. Um, haven't been an impact fee administrator for the not, not only the county attorney. at one point, but also for the city. <laughs> um, I've made my bones playing in the creative line of the law in government. You know, and I can tell you, there's get it right a lot. There's one or two times I hadn't, but uh, this this is something that I feel very strongly about. And anytime you have a, a nagging question, you know, the state of Florida offers this thing up in Tallahassee, the AG, they'll give you an opinion. They'll just lay it out for you. But um, I think it's, I definitely think it's fundable in that respect. I really do. And I assume you're aware that we're um, trying to get an emergency relook at impact fees this year? No, I have not. I'm not aware of yeah, that. Yeah, because we're at 50% right now of what the consultant said we should be at. On all categories or just transportation? Um, I don't know. But okay. if, if we get the emergency look, we will be able to discuss all of it, and then it's up to the board what we're going to do. But we first have to get yeah. that approval that we can look at it sooner than we're allowed. Most of the time it's, you know, you have these buckets of impact fees, you have public buildings, yeah, yeah, you have yeah. fire, fire school. Yeah, the, the big one that everybody goes for is transportation because yep. when times are bad, no one cares. When times would be good and houses are going up everywhere and apartments and this yep. and that, and everybody wants to get the uh, transportation. Um, and there's elements to use impact fees within those buckets uh, on a singular issue, not just as it relates in the park itself, but th there's other elements that things like that could go to. But okay. you know, I'll have a discussion to... with Mr. Howard, and we'll try to figure Absolutely. this out. Absolutely. Any other okay. questions, comments, anything else, Eric? I'm good. You all have a great week and, and weekend. Yeah, I think it's an interesting project. You know, mm -hmm. kind of want to hear more. There's not enough to make a decision on by any means, but yeah, it's, it's certainly a worthwhile discussion. The, the RV and one conversation. looks like and a really good investment. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, and, and again, didn't come here today want a decision. I mean, it, it, this is millions of dollars. You know? that, yeah, I would tell you, though, as it relates to the annual reoccurring monies to both cities, uh, the, what I quote unquote the 150, I, I really think you should give that strong consideration in the near future, especially as you go into potentially developing a budget for next year, because that, that is something that both cities, in my opinion, are in really need of.
And there's a lot of benefit there. You're, you're going to get a lot of cost benefit there. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate it. And you know I love you guys, but I've already read it all very well. I'll be right back. Yep. <laughs> I will keep this brief. Through this. So more money. That's good. Another another month that we're that we're up after just one down. So um, see seven and a half percent over best year ever. That's pretty strong effort. And uh, we'll turn it over to the social media. <laughs> Told you to be brief. Hello. Good morning. Uh, my name is Alyssa Hofelt and I head up social media for Discover Crystal River, and we're going to go over um, the last month. Um, so if we look at our Facebook page, um, there was uh, Manatee Appreciation Day on, I believe, March 29th. Um, so I did a post. Um, it was a dual post. It was for Homosassa Springs Wildlife Park and the Crystal River Wildlife Refuge complex and visitor center. And that did quite well. That was our um, best performing post. And uh, our reach was 136,000 just for that uh, post. And I did want to mention another post that did well was an original content post on the Cove in Inverness. Um, that got over 1,000 likes. This, this actually got over 2,000 likes. Um, but the Cove got over 1,000 likes. I think it was like 20% uh, 200 shares, so 20% of the likes shared it, which is very good. Um, and that got a reach of almost 100,000, just that one post on the coat. Um, again, uh, Captain Tommy is our, you know, face of our fishing page. He always um, does the best on our fishing page. And then on Instagram, um, I put together a, a, a video. It was from Crystal River... Um, uh, get up and go kayaking. And I took three of their posts, little videos. I edited those together, um, put up an appropriate uh, music or song on top. And then I posted it on our Instagram page. Um, Love Florida um, reached out to us and they reshared it, which is also really great because they have a much bigger reach than we do. They have about I think it's close to 300,000 followers. Um, and they shared that video. And um, I believe now it's over 90,000. So that did quite well. And it was nice of them that they shared our post. Um, oh, and I'm turning to the next one. <laughs> and again, uh, this is good news. We're gaining more followers than any of our competitors. Um, so we're like uh, this on Instagram. Uh, this month we had 893 followers, um, which is just up a little bit from last month. But uh, the other, our other competitors, um, our other like Florida destinations, they're getting about three or 400 new followers a month. And so we're getting double that. So that's really good. Uh, we are gaining on uh, Florida historic coast slowly, but we are doing it. Um, and if you look at, um, let's see, uh, I went over that. Um, we reached 140,000 total accounts. Um, and it was up uh, almost 35% this month. Um, on Facebook, I mean, we reached over a half a million accounts. Um, and we have a lot of engagement on Facebook, a lot of comments and a lot of shares, which I like to see because it means that um, our followers are getting a value out of the content and they want to, uh, share it with their friends and family or maybe go back to it at a later time. And then the stories, I keep on doing those almost daily. I love those. They're little, um, they're vertical, vir vir vertical videos or photos. They last 24 hours and they're a great way to promote um, things quickly. So I can promote events or attractions, restaurants. Um, I just promoted the plantation yesterday on one of the stories. Um, so uh, I really like those. And we reached 54,000 people, almost 55,000 people just with our stories. So I like those. Those are fun for me to create. And um, I think they do a lot of good. Um, do you have any questions? 
congrats on 30,000 followers. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah we're, doing, we're doing really well. All right, well, thank you. <laughs> no more voice from above. I know, I don't have to scare everybody every time. <laughs> It's like, oh, she's there. <laughs> um, so we are slowly but surely kicking back into gear now that I am back in action. Um, we have one coming in next week that is a Visit Florida opportunity from Canada. And uh, you did make a, a point about soccer moms. That is a fantastic market to be advertising to because moms plan vacations. Dads don't. Uh, and then we also have one coming in, um, The Walking Mermaid. We're doing a lot of mermaid initiatives <laughs> here in the near future, um, working hand in hand with the Mer Taylor on many of those. Uh, we also visited them after that Inverness meet and greet. That was mm -hmm. where our next stop on the list was the Mer Taylor. So they were. I really, come. really wish I could have been there the whole day. I just didn't have the schedule. Oh, it's all good. It was kind of a, a quick turnaround like most things in news tend to be. So mm -hmm. uh, we didn't get the date uh, until the week before. So it was a quick plan, but it worked really well. And they were able to meet a lot of local business owners and uh, officials yourself, the city officials, things of that nature. So it was great. Um, the Walking Mermaid will be coming in. She does, uh, this is another kind of a mommy focused uh, influencer opportunity. And then one that I didn't have a chance to add to this presentation, but they will be coming in at the end of the month is Caminito Amor. It is a uh, Brazilian influencer group or couple, sorry. And they have over 200,000 followers on Instagram and Brazil is a great market for us as well. So, so that's excited. added to this list? Yes, that will be an addition. And how does a mermaid walk exactly? You know, I think it's a spiritual part for the mermaid. But, okay, uh, just checking. <laughs> um, one thing that we are working on and that will be launching later this month um, is a Mercation giveaway. So we're partnering with local businesses, including the Mer Taylor, the Plantation, Crystal River Water Sports for this giveaway. So they will win a two night stay at the Plantation, as well as breakfast at West 82 and a manatee swim tour at the Plantation Adventure Center. They will also win a tail from the Mer Taylor and they will win a monofin swimming lesson from Crystal River Water Sports. So um, when you said more than manatees, uh, mermaids are on that list, and we're definitely highlighting that as much as possible. When does the little mermaid come out? 20, oh, 20, 20, who would have thought such a thing? <laughs> uh, that I would know? No, 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 Six. that we would possibly be doing a mermaid vacation the same month that... Uh, well, I knew it was this month. I'm just asking when it came out. No, that was our all, initiative. Was, yeah, they're, um, they're budgets bigger than ours. Just a smidge. But mermaids are on the forefront of people's minds at the moment, and that's what we decided to take advantage of, uh, if you will. <laughs> so, uh, here we go. So if you take a look here, these are our uh, PR reports, kind of for the first quarter, maybe not necessarily January, but since I've been gone. Um, so over 250 million impressions since February. Uh, a lot of that comes from some online articles, but we've also got great uh, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok content as well. Uh, as far as our views up there, you can see over 230,000 and over 20,000 engagements. Um, one big project that you guys did approve that we uh, have finalized or that has come to fruition and has now aired is the RV There Yet project. Uh, I was able to share this info with the um, Inverness Area Council at their last meeting as well, and they were very excited. So here is the teaser trailer for that that kind of shows you how much of an all-encompassing county trip they were able to take. Right here, kids. 
So as you saw, we kind of hit all around. Um, they stayed at the Cove, which the Cove has communicated with us several times now that people have called booking because of this episode. So we're seeing a great return right. on investment mm -hmm. immediately. Um, people are also really excited because they try and get them in the exact same spot that they stayed in. So it's and kind you know of I showed up. Yes. When they were there having dinner. Uh, I know. It was a great little community. Me, Commissioner Davis, and the RV there yet people all at the Cove at once. Um, and so they, uh, they biked the trail, they went out with wild bills and then they moved over to the Withcoochee state forest, which I think is an amazing asset to our community that we could definitely continue to highlight more. Um, we've finally gotten a partnership running with Rymar ranch to help promote the equestrian side of our County and those trail rides. So they were able to go out and do a trail ride and also highlight how at Tillis Hill, you can bring your own horses and board them there. That's such an amazing, unique asset that they have. Um, they went over to Home South Springs Wildlife State Park to, uh, and they were actually able to interview uh, Kate Spratt, who runs the park over there, the visitor services. Um, and they haven't been, they uh, haven't been permitted to do interviews in quite a while. So that was very exciting that they agreed to do that one. And then, of course, they swam with the manatees because you can't have not have your bread and butter thrown in there as well. And um, Captain Paul Cross did an amazing job communicating the conservation and the manatee manor side of things, as he always does. I highly encourage anybody that wants to to watch the full episode. It's on YouTube under RV There Yet. Uh, great, great episode. So as far as our Inverness coverage for the first quarter of the year, we did a designated uh, press trip, which was, it was supposed to be um, for journalists and influencers, but unfortunately one of them had a, a, a conflict at the very last minute, so it ended up being three. And they came to cycle the trail as well as attend the Strawberry Festival. So a little bit of Inverness Floral City action there. And you can see we had well over 2 million impressions come from that trip alone. Um, and a lot of that was a USA Today article that was written about it. And it was a fantastic article focused solely on Inverness and Floral City um, that really highlighted the small town charm and what they have to offer. Um, can I add a note to that? Sure. I've already gotten yelled at twice because people said, now that this is out there, more people are going to come. And I'm like, that, so that's the whole point. Yes, we're, <laughs> we're doing our best here. Christina, if you could click the Cycling Strawberry Fest link for me. Um, it'll just show you a few of the deliverables that have come out of that one. Login. There's an update, so uh, I'm going to go through all the next now. Sorry. Technological issue. Well, <laughs> you might have to skip this one. I can I send them out after this. Yeah. Okay. That's okay, but there's something going on with the... Does the Tabitha mm -hmm. Blue one work? I think it's the same, yeah. It's because there was an update on the computer last oh, night. Oh, gotcha. Well, hold on. That works. So maybe yeah, I can yeah. do this now. Here she comes, she shakes her tail. <laughs> the woman in the bathroom. <laughs> I have it up now. Oh, you get it? Perfect. Okay. Yeah, come towards so the this is the cycling. Perfect. If we scroll down a bit, you can just get a good look. So Hi, Kathy. Um, Lorraine was a content creator that came and visited. She did a ton of posts on Instagram. If you keep scrolling as well as um, Pinterest, which she's got a great following on Pinterest. She's got her own blog. Facebook account, more on the Instagram, and then I believe she did some TikToks as well. And then if we continue, we should be able to see that USA Today news coverage. Yeah, continue a little bit further. There you go here. So those were the two um, other journalists that attended. So the USA Today article hit 1.9 million impressions. And then uh, 25,000 from the Montauk Sun, which is a um, publication up there in the Hamptons. So uh, one of those key markets that we are trying to increase and grow. And then for the Tabitha one, uh, Tabitha Blue is a mommy blogger that we've brought in before for the Galentine's trip. We did um, 
last year, the year before, and she focused on Home Assassin Floral City then, so we brought her back for an Inverness trip. And if you want to scroll down a bit, you can hit that uh, view on Instagram button there, and we can watch her reel that she did. And make sure to hit the volume. Yes. Maybe. Oh, it's going to try to make you log in. Probably. Yep. Uh, well, yeah. You can watch it when she sends out the link. <laughs> but it's a great one. Um, I've had the pleasure of showing it to several of the businesses that she went to while she was in Inverness, including like Nine State Brewery, and they were all very happy with that, um, with the coverage that came from that. So we can go back. I, I saw her, her content was amazing. Yes. And we shared it um, on our social media. But, but all of the mm -hmm. content from the Right. And the good thing from Tabitha and RV there yet is that we got a ton of materials, um, including video and photos from the both of them that we can now use in our own marketing. Some of those drone shots that we got in Inverness from RV there yet are absolutely phenomenal and things that we will be using in marketing in the future. Let me go back to the slides, please. Yes, ma'am. All right. Uh, for Home Assassa, we had an Atlanta Journal-Constitutional article that covered um, the wildlife park as well as a few of the things that they have to do there in Home Assassa with um, nearly 80,000 impressions that came off of that our online article. Is that photo actually Home Assassa at the top? Yes, that's the crack. I don't think... I don't know Home Assassa. I actually know Chaz better than Home Assassa. That is the Chaz, yeah. Oh, is it Chaz? Okay. Mm -hmm. It's the um, Baird Creek leading up to the crack. Okay, because I thought that looked like Chaz. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all right. Yes, ma'am. So, um, Chaz... But you're considering Chazowitz goes part of Home Assassa Metro? That's how we market it, them. <laughs> um, it's because, you know, Chaz doesn't have... It's got tons of beautiful natural things to offer, but as far as the infrastructure... Oh, yeah. It relies Ch heavily on home assassin. Spectacular. Yes. So that's how we tend to view it. Um, and then for Crystal River, we had three trips in. Um, and uh, we called her Alex while she was here. I don't know how to pronounce her. Maybe Andrea. I'm not sure. Um, she was here. She is a um, Christian mommy blogger that focuses on... The, her um, family values while traveling. So that is a great opportunity for a different market. And then we had the National Park Travelers. They came um, to focus on seeing the manatees from outside of the water as well as kayaking. They got to do a Chaz kayaking tour. Um, and then the Wild Thorn Baileys was a, a last minute opportunity. They are a nomadic family that they were coming through town with a PBS show that was filming them. And uh, they asked last minute to for us to host them on a manatee swim tour. I was able to reach out to Mike and he put it together the very last minute for us. And so far at this point, when I put the presentation together, we've seen um, 277,000 impressions and the PBS um, show has not come out yet. So that's just based on their own social media platforms. So that'll be interesting moving forward to see how that goes. And that will be the end from me. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Great. All good. Sorry, John, I did not keep it short. Oh, well, that's, <laughs> I'll keep it short. I have an, yeah, I have another You board. guys can read this. I have another board did. meeting to go chair shortly. Yeah. So. <laughs> that's what I did. Yeah. I'm good. Moving on. <laughs> You're good? That's it? Yeah. 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 We all read it? Yeah. Okay. We all read it. Awesome. <laughs> so, uh, you can read. Before one thing, I, I handed out a, a snapshot a graphic of some updates. Uh, part of the presentation I'll be making tomorrow to the county commission. Uh, the real number to notice on that is the county year 22 uh, direct dollar. Uh, $302 million is what the industry brought into the county in county year 22, according to uh, research data services. So, um, where is that? Uh, that's the handout. It should. It should. The, the color handout there. Yeah, the blue. Oh, I was looking for the that dollar figure. And I'm like, it's on the back. It's on the oh, other it's one. Two sided. Yeah. I absolutely swear that I like my fellow board members. So take this with a grain of salt when I say if you have any time to come to our commission meeting tomorrow to be here for the TDC presentation to back up the board, that would not be a bad idea. And the staff. So. Is there a time on it? 
I don't know. Is there a time certain on it? I don't know. I'll look when I get back to the office and see. I, I, it was a presentation, so I'm not, I'm not sure if we got assigned the time or not, but I'll take a look uh, and send out a note. I can look at the agenda and maybe maybe take a wild guess at when it would be up, but yeah. uh, maybe send a note to all the – because we just yep. missed – we lost a lot of board members. Right. So. I'll, I'll send it out when we get back. When I get back to the office, I'll take a look and Good see what, what it is. Yeah, we <laughs> – Anyway. I'm not sure that we actually have to any take other a vote business on that. by board. We all good? We're good. I think. All right. Our right. next meeting is when? I gave away my reading glasses. June. <laughs> June 14th. June 14th. So our next meeting will be June 14th, 2023, and we are adjourned. Oh. Nope. Oh. You don't have to do public. Oh. I go. Anybody want to do open to the public? I'll unadjourn us. Nope. We're good. Okay. Good. <laughs>